police officer. I think that would be asking too much, frankly. Uh, but still, a very interesting comment. I thought that if you do have that, uh, you should. If you have a gun in your hand, you know you shouldn't die with your gun in your hand. I thought that was interesting. There's an amazing story though that's sort of related to that about what happened in Dobsonville in Soweto over the weekend, where a Metro police officer, a Joburg Metro police officer, she was shot and killed in a shootout with South African police service officers. And let me explain what happened. As I understand the story, is that her son was driving uh, very badly and was pulled over by SAPS by the police and they said you're driving recklessly and negligently and they wanted to this all happened i think early in the morning and you kind of know what that means um but they pulled him over he refused to be pulled over and kept driving so they followed him they get to his house right he jumps out of his car as i understand it uh, mum comes out his mum comes out and says what's going on and they say we're coming here to arrest your son and she says no you won't i'm going to get my gun she comes out with her gun and starts shooting so the police fire back and now she's dead it's an astonishing story that says speaks to so many things. It speaks to the relationship between the police and the metro police in Joburg and other places. It speaks to um, the sheer number of guns in our society and a willingness to use them. And it also speaks to somewhere there's a young man who started the chain of events that led to this because he was driving badly. Or, well, I think more than driving badly. Uh, but, you know, it's uh, it just there is so much to the story and it's sort of a microcosm of so many issues that are happening um, in our society at the moment. Um, the University of Fort Hare, there's a big story in Daily Maverick this morning. Professor Sakela Bukhlungu says that the, many of the people involved in the corruption, they knew each other before they came to Fort Hare. He's given the sort of detailed explanation of, you know, where they all come from and how they might have known each other beforehand because it was also carefully planned to steal so much money. And I do wonder if that happens, you know. Um, I've never understood why people who have a good job, and I mean, I've never been in that position, so maybe I don't know, but people who have a good job would suddenly hatch a plan to steal a huge amount of money when you know the consequences, I mean, can ruin your life and ruin the life of your family. I've never really understood the risk, but maybe that's just a comment on me. I don't know. It's a very strange sort of thing. Um. Transnet, and this is a very important story that sort of develops. You know, Pier 2 in Durban, almost half of the, uh, of the, the, the stuff that comes into South Africa and leaves South Africa is imported and exported through Pier 2 in Durban, right? It's massive. And there's this um, idea of having a privatized sort of arrangement or semi-privatization, whatever you want to call it. The Filipino company, which is called International Containers, basically they International Container Services, that's the name. The idea is that they will run it for 25 years. And now a Danish company called AP Mollemersk has gone to court to say that Transnet did not make the right decision in choosing the company from the Philippines. Both of them, by the way, have very long track records in managing ports like this. And this is unfortunate because this could delay the process and we really need Pier 2 at Durban to work. And if it doesn't, we're in big trouble. So I'm a bit concerned about the delay there. I think that's serious. And then um, this is interesting, and I wonder how this is going to play out. Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, has said... He will come to South Africa on a state visit. Um, and haven't we seen, you know, the Russian foreign minister quite recently, a couple of months, a few months ago, we've seen um, our Navy conducting operations with the Russian Navy. And here in the middle of all of this, the war between them, the Russian president, Vladimir Zelensky, is going to come on a state visit. And of course, we're involved in the African Leaders Peace Initiative, I think it's called, uh, with President Cyril Ramaphosa. So there's a lot going on uh, there. And I wonder how that will play out. You know how to get in touch with us. 86 0 2032 SMS 41391. Tweet SFM Radio. And that's Stephen Crutter. Send your WhatsApp voice notes to 0614104107. Good morning. It's Monday morning. It's a quarter past six. The Daily News Diary on SAFM. And Musa, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. How's it all going? All good. Cold, but all good. <laughs> yes. Uh, wet in some places. <laughs> Very um, true. And yeah, I think it's going to be a busy week. That's my sense of it so far. Definitely it will be. But today, you know, our focus, especially it's cold and wet weather over large parts of the country this coming week. So looking at the situation in the Western Cape where a level nine flood warning was issued and strong winds and heavy rain that's expected in the Boerland, the Halderberg Basin. Schools we know have been closed for today and a Disaster Coordinating Committee has been activated in the Western Cape and that's following the severe weather conditions of gale force winds and the rainfall. 
We then also looking at the MK party that is going to the electoral court to challenge the exclusion of former President Jacob Zuma from the list of those going to Parliament. So our focus on the electoral court that will hear former President Jacob Zuma's appeal after the IEC upheld in objection against the former president's candidature and Zuma was ranked number one on the Mkonto Wesizwe party's candidates list. I'm waiting to see if we'll find out who lodged the objections. And, you know, I think the electoral commission has to be quite careful. People have a right to, to lodge an objection and not have their personal information made known. But Very in a true. court case, in a court case, you, you have the right to know your accuser, if yes. you know what I mean. So um, so I wonder if we'll actually see the objections. There was actually some article, um, I think I read it about sometime last week, about someone actually saying that whoever was mentioned or his name is out there and actually it was not lodged by him so oh, it will wow. be interesting yes it will be uh, interesting but in court papers i mean it would have to be right i think so let's see yeah so um it's also the pre-trial of the 65 alleged instigators of the 2021 civil unrest who face charges of murder and terrorism um in the durban high court and the accused are aged between 29 and 62 they are mostly um, residents of kwazulu natal with some of them from the free state and gauteng and the murder charge they face relates to the state's allegation that they conspired to kill the Chief Justice Raymond Zondo. That's following the 15-month imprisonment of the former President Jacob Zuma for contempt of court and after he refused to appear before the Commission of Inquiry into the state capture that was chaired by Zondo. It's an amazing story, that. Yeah. Another court case, the bail application of the five men that's accused of the murder of musician Keenan Forbes, a.k.a. and his friend Tabelo Tibbs Mutswane, continues in the Durban Magistrates Court. And just lastly, an inquest into to the Enyobeni court case is expected to sit at the Mdansane Regional Court from today and it is to establish if anyone can be held criminally liable by commission or omission for the tragic deaths of the 21 teenagers at the Scenery Park Tavern on the 26th of June 2022. Yeah, it's an amazing story. And Musab, thank you very much indeed. We'll be listening on the radio 18 minutes after 6. Stephen Krutis on SAFM. Let's have a look at your weather around the country this morning. Tswane, cloudy, scattered showers and thunder showers 15 and 19. Johannesburg, cloudy, scattered showers, thunder showers 13 and 17. Frenachan, cloudy, scattered showers, thunder showers 13 and 18. Bombella, uh, otherwise uh, cloudy, uh, fine this morning, otherwise cloudy. Isolated showers and thunder showers 16 and 20. Polokwani, cloudy, scattered showers, thunder showers 17 and 20. Mahaken, cloudy and windy, widespread showers and thunder showers 15 and 19. Freiburg, cloudy and windy. Widespread showers, thunder showers 12 and 22. Mangum, cloudy and windy, widespread showers and thunder showers 11 and 20. Kimberley, cloudy and windy, widespread showers and thunder showers 11 and 23. Uppington, partly cloudy and windy, isolated evening showers and thunder showers 9 and 22. Cape Town, cloudy, widespread showers, thunder showers, a strong southeasterly wind, a reaching near gale force at times, so still strong winds today in Cape Town. 17 and 18, the temperatures tells you what the weather is like there, doesn't it? George, cloudy, widespread. Red showers, thunder showers, a strong easterly wind, 15 and 20. Klaberka, cloudy, widespread morning showers and rain. A moderate to fresh easterly wind, 17 and 24. East London, cloudy, widespread showers and rain, clearing in the evening. A moderate to fresh northeasterly wind, 18 and 22. Etiquini today, cloudy, scattered showers and rain, a moderate to fresh southeasterly, 19 and 26. Richards Bay, cloudy, scattered showers and rain, a light to moderate northeasterly, 19 and 25. And Peter Maritzburg, cloudy, scattered showers and rain, 15 and 26. Are you blowing your paycheck on car insurance every month? Monica, 39 from Three Rivers, pays just 1,515 rand a month for her 2018 BMW 320i. None of the insurance companies has come near to the price I'm paying. I am happy at our insurance. I'm going nowhere. <laughs> SMS out to 30754 now for a quick quote that could save you hundreds every month. You'll also find out about included benefits like panic assistance and help it out 24-hour roadside assistance. Yusuf, 45 from Tejadal, pays just 700 rand a month for his 2021 VW Polo. Help it out. Took the family up to go and see the snow and I got stuck. The service was quick, even though it was in a very remote area. Absolutely phenomenal service from our children. SMS out to 30754 now. That's out to 30754. Our insurance is a licensed insurer and FSP. T's, C's and limits apply. Premiums are risk profile dependent and reviewed annually. Client comments do not constitute financial advice. Two years since winning the EFC middleweight title in the most dramatic and controversial fashion, Luke Michael finally defends his belt for the very first time at EFC 112 against the imposing submission machine, J.P. Kruger. 
And in the co-main event, featherweight champion Iga Smiley Cabessa becomes the next athlete aiming for champ champ status as he battles the imposing Kaleka Block Cabanda. EFC 112 live this Thursday. Watch it on SABC Sport Channel on DTT Channel 4 from 7 p.m. Brought to you by SABC Sport. Worldview Update, bringing you closer to international or global news. 21 minutes after 6, good morning. Good to have you with us this morning. In South America, almost all of the governments in that continent have lined up to condemn the actions of Ecuador, who broke diplomatic conventions by sending police into the Mexican embassy in Ecuador to arrest a former Ecuadorian vice president who had been seeking asylum there. So, over the weekend, Ecuadorian police went into the embassy and dragged out Jorge Klaas, who faces serious corruption charges. Mexico has now broken off diplomatic ties with Ecuador. In response, Professor Andre Thomashausen is a professor emeritus of international law at UNISA. Professor Thomashausen, good morning. Thanks for your time. Yes, good morning, Stephen. Good morning, listeners. I can't remember something like this happening in recent times. A country storming the embassy of another country and dragging someone out. Is there any legal standing for Ecuador to do this? Well, no, there isn't. Uh, There's the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations of 1961. And um, one thing is for absolutely certain that embassies enjoy absolute immunity. Uh, So uh, the host country cannot uh, enter that embassy under any circumstances. There's some argument that if there is a Uh, a fire raging and people's lives are at risk that they could enter without permission. So we don't have this situation. But we've had similar things and they involve Ecuador. We've had the the dramatic situation of Assange, the diplomat who who betrayed uh, America's uh, um, worst secrets from the Iraq war and started the WikiLeaks, and he went to seek refuge in the embassy of Ecuador in London, and he lived there for seven years, and then he was removed by the British police. But the big difference was that there had been a regime change in Ecuador before America actually spent $3 billion to remove the Ecuadorian government and replace it with a more pro-American regime. And Ecuador had asked the British police to come and enter the the embassy because Mr. Assange didn't want to leave voluntarily. So um, Ecuador has had its its difficult situations with the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Immunities. So on the one side, Ecuador has used the fact that you're not allowed into another country's embassy um, when it protected Assange, as you say, it changed its mind. And now it's gone completely against the own principle that it used in the case of Mexico's embassy. Absolutely. But in the meantime, we have a new president in Ecuador, Mr. Noboa. He is a U.S.-born, Miami-born Ecuadorian, and he is the son of the biggest uh, banana empire in Ecuador. He is probably, uh, by his mindset and his attitude, more American than Ecuadorian. And uh, I guess uh, he's only been in power for for, uh, for a year, not even for a year. He, he was inaugurated in November 2023. And the first thing he did, he dramatically increased the VAT rate, the tax rate, and he declared a state of emergency with which he suppressed any possible resistance or protest. So he seems to be a very heavy-handed guy who um, who possibly thought that America created the terrible precedent of, of entering Nicaragua some 20 years ago to arrest mm-hmm. the sitting president of Nicaragua and dragging him to a court in, in America. So he probably thought there's state practice that allows him to just ignore the diplomatic convention. We are seeing um, conflicts around the world, around embassies. And I mean, you, you, you point to if there's a fire, for example, I think in one or two cases, fires have deliberately been started to try and get um, people out. If I remember correctly, during the Iranian revolution, uh, people sat outside the US embassy there and, and I think made a noise. I think in uh, China, once a British consulate was nearly set on fire, there was pressure, there were protests outside there. There are all sorts of examples. But for example, when two countries are at war, are there 
their embassy is often still respected. I mean, could Russia be respecting the Ukrainian embassy in Moscow right now, for example, because they stick to the convention that Ecuador has not? No, no. Russia has always adhered very formalistically, very precisely to their international obligations. Um, they have, for instance, not retaliated against America when America stormed American consulates, uh, Russian consulates all over America with police force to retrieve documents and what they presume to be possibly uh, interesting information. So um, uh, uh, Russia definitely respects its obligations under the Vienna Convention. And I guess it is very important that that even in times of great tension, of conflict, even of war, um, a, a minimum of of international law rules um, can can survive and can subsist because they they rely on reciprocity. If if one country doesn't respect the diplomatic privileges of another, then obviously that country might find itself in in the same predicament. And if we destroy uh, diplomatic relations, um, then we will find it much more difficult to actually communicate, to actually talk about things that mm. might that might end the conflict. So this is this is a, a sign of the of the decline in, in in the respect for international law. And of course, the Israeli conflict is also another example. And the very Ukrainian conflict is uh, that international law is going through. Uh, a very bad time to a time of, of, of great crisis. Professor Andrew Thomas Housen, thank you. Professor Emeritus for International Law at UNICEF. You with SAFM 27 minutes after six. This is SAFM Sport with Zai Khan. Zai, good morning. Good morning. I'm a Zulu beating Cape Town City. Oh, the Asutu Warriors showing their spirit on the pitch. Yes, 1 0 was the scoreline over Cape Town City. In a match that took place at the DHL Stadium yesterday, the win leaving Usutu 12th on the league standings, two points behind eighth place Kaiser Chiefs. Coach Pablo Franco Martin's side will now host Orlando Pirates in a Netbank Cup quarterfinal match. That's on the 13th of April. The Citizens, on the other hand, are placed seventh on the standings, two points behind fourth place Sekakuna United. Coach Eric Tinkler's side will be targeting a win when they face. Polokwana City away in a league clash. That's on the 21st of April. Elsewhere, Manchester United and Liverpool played out to a two-all draw at Old Trafford as Jurgen Klopp's side missed the chance to reclaim top spot in the Premier League. The visitors dominated the majority of the game but needed a Mohamed Salah penalty six minutes from time to avoid a second defeat at Old Trafford in the space of three weeks. Liverpool boss Jurgen Klopp. We played really good in so many moments and we had five, ten minutes period, so like they score. And the second goal, obviously, we don't push up properly. That's why they find him in between the lines, blah, 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 they can turn. And then in the end, it ends up with an incredible finish as well. Um, but after that, we were again in charge. Yeah, that, that, that now you can say if you, if you have that much of a dominance in, 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 in for long parts of the game, you should win the game. Yeah, that's true. Now the draw ensuring Manchester United avoided back-to-back defeats following their 4-3 loss to Chelsea in midweek, allowing them to dent their old rivals' title hopes in the process, with leaders Arsenal now in pole position in the race for the crown. Other way, we have uh, Ajax turbulent campaign hitting a low as they suffered a record 6-0 loss to rivals Feyenoord in the Eredivisie. It's the first time Ajax have lost a competitive match by a six-goal margin. Cricket action, the Tuskers, they had a six-wicket win over the Titans in their Cricket South Africa T20 Challenge match took place at Supersport Park in Centurion yesterday. The Titans put up 165 in their 20 overs and the Tuskers scored 166 for four in 17.4 overs. The victory over the Titans is the Tuskers' second win of the season. More cricket, Indian seam bowler Yash Thakur took five wickets and that was uh, against the Lucknow Super Giants while they beat the Gujarat Titans. The 25-year-old who's yet to play an international took two wickets in the 19th to seal Lucknow's third win from four games this season. South Africa's Gerald Kutsia, he took four for 34 to help restrict Delhi Capitals as they went on to beat them. And that was one, some wonderful news for South African teams that are helping teams like the Mumbai Indians to victory. And finally, cycling, Matthew van der Poel won the Paris-Roubaix yesterday after a 60-kilometre solo attack. The reigning world champion became the first rider to claim the title 
two years in a row. Jasper Philipson took the second place as he outsprinted Mads Pedersen, who finished third to complete the podium. A wrap of your sports. We'll have more top of the hour. I'm Zai Khan. Zai, thanks very much indeed. Good morning. We'll ask the Public Servants Association if public service workers are actually being more productive. What kind of service do you get from public servants work? Public service workers. Uh, that's coming up next. You with SFM leading the conversation. Uh, day twelve of no load shedding at six thirty. Good morning. In the headlines, the Western Cape Premier Alan Windy says a disaster coordinating committee has been activated following severe weather conditions in the province. He announced that schools will be closed today in the Overberg, Cape Winelands and Halderberg amid warnings of heavy rainfall. Police Minister Becky Kele has sent out a strong warning to criminals who refuse to surrender to law enforcement officers, saying their days are numbered. He was addressing the media in Pretoria yesterday. And the BBC has found that hundreds of Rohingya Muslims have been conscripted in recent weeks to fight for Myanmar's armed forces. Rohingyas are denied citizenship and were subjected to what the UN called textbook ethnic cleansing by the military in 2017. I'll have details on these and other stories at 7. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Get it rain moving into parts of Kauteng. Take it easy. It will uh, get in your way. It will cause delays. The wet weather conditions on your way to work. So just come out and allow extra time. If it's a wet where you are, a uh, truck crash on the R24 in Eden Vale. If you're arriving from the airport down in towards Galoolis, that's a big queue, which is just expected to uh, uh, continue to grow. The N12 coming in from the Davyton side, uh, just slow as you come into Benoni through Snake Road and uh, down towards Tom Jones, looking uh, quite uh, heavily backed up. A breakdown on the M1 south in Midrand at New Road. So that's already very slow all the way back to John Foster Drive. And before you even get there, there's a major delay coming out of Pretoria on the M1 South. It's a crash before Rigel Avenue. Uh, traffic's all the way back, almost to the N4, Emma Lafetti Highway. That's a really big queue. Uh, the bus crash at Escort, uh, on your way there, Escort at Escort South. That scene has been cleared. So uh, that big backlog, thankfully, has been released and is uh, making its way through there. Uh, truck crash between Coxstad and uh, Brooks Neck. That is a truck and a taxi that's been involved in that. So uh, south of Coxstad on the N2, there's some very heavy disruption. And Cape Town, a bit of flooding, uh, fresh flooding this morning on 35th Avenue at Bishop Lavis. The traffic lights there at 35th and Roberts of Big Wave are also down. That's going to be busy. And coming out of Mitchell's Plain, heavy backlogs on the M7. Looks like lights are down at Samora Michelle. That's uh, a big queue there. Baden Powell closed at Monmouth. BC closed at Coastal Park. So that's going to uh, put extra traffic on the Spine Road option through the Strandfontein area. Uh, the main road at Glen Can, just south of Fishhooks, closed. Clarence Drive closed. Chapman's Peak Drive still closed as well. I'm Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. The business update on SAFM. Jimmy Moyaha, business show host. Good morning. How are you doing? Jimmy, are you there? Yes, oh, I am. There you are. Sorry about that. Good morning. Um, uh, Asian markets, US markets, how's it all looking? <laughs> Well, U.S. markets had a rather strong close to the week last week. We saw that Nasdaq closed about 1.2% in the green, with the S&P 1.1% in the green, and the Dow up about 0.8%. Asian markets at the moment are in a bit of a mixed uh, bag again, starting off the week with Tokyo uh, up almost a full percent, up about 0.8% at the moment. Uh, We know, of course, that we're likely to see uh, the Bank of Japan leave interest rates on hold uh, following Following the recent data that suggests that uh, labor uh, hourly wages in Japan have dropped or the wage rate has dropped in Japan. Uh, In Hong Kong, uh, the market's down about a third of a percent. In South Korea, markets up 0.4 percent, with Indian markets up about 0.5 percent. Chinese markets are back in trade after having a two-day holiday last week. They are down about a 0.5 percent in the case of the top 50, and the Chinese Composite Index uh, down about three quarters of a percent. Markets in uh, the Philippines are also down about 0.8%. We're seeing that on the commodities front, uh, the recent events unfolding in the Middle East have given gold a spur on, continues to march on. It's at $2,363 an ounce on the future sign and $2,344 on the cash, uh, with silver up about 1.6%, copper down 0.1%, platinum and palladium also rebounding, each up uh, about a quarter of a percent there. The price of Brent crude has come down marginally.
marginally after having breached that $90 a barrel level. And that's largely off the back of the developments, as I said, happening in the Middle East at the moment. We see that uh, some recent comments from Iran have uh, resulted in the Israeli Defense Force or Israel uh, withdrawing troops from Gaza, uh, whether that w- they've claimed that was for strategic reasons. Um, but we also know that Iran made it uh, very clear to the US that if Israel were to pursue this uh, or were to continue to um, invade the region of Rafah on the ground, that they would launch a uh, military attack of their own, uh, that's being Iran, into Israel. So that seems to have put uh, quite a spanner in the works in terms of the ongoing Israeli war that we've been witnessing. Uh, But we'll keep an eye on that and see how that continues to affect the oil price going forward. In terms of the currencies, the rand, 18 rand 70 against the dollar, uh, 20 20 rand and 26 cents against the euro, 23.62 against the British pound. The dollar seems to be recovering ever so slightly uh, following those jobs numbers that came out uh, last week. If we have a quick squiz at the cryptocurrency space, Bitcoin just below $70,069,317 there. Ethereum, $3,415, up almost a full percent. And Solana, $175.97, down about 2.5% at this stage. And then U.S. jobs start coming in hotter than expected. Yes, U.S. jobs data was expected to come in around the 200,000 mark, uh, came in at 303,000, suggesting that the U.S. economy is creating far more jobs than what was anticipated by analysts at this stage. And that, therefore, um, points to the U.S. economy remaining stronger than expected and potentially delaying the interest rate cuts. If you think back to last year, we anticipated we would have rate cuts from as early as March of this year. We had priced in anywhere from 7 to nine rate cuts. We've since revised that down to only three rate cuts from the U.S. economy, and we had started to price those in from the second half of the year. If the jobs data is anything to go by, we could be pushing that out even further. So instead of seeing rate cuts begin in June and July, we might even see them begin in August. At this stage, it's still very early to tell, but what we do know is that Fed Chair Jerome Powell and his Fed team are keeping an eye on data points like this um, that will inform their decision. So markets at the moment are anticipating we might be seeing rate cuts happen later. And we saw the dollar uh, see some volatility on Friday, and now we're seeing it start to stabilize a bit. It's, it's recovered some of the ground it's lost. Thank you very much indeed. Our business show host, Jimmy Moyaha. You'll hear him later on on SAFM, also in an hour's time, 22 minutes to 7. Africa Update on SAFM Sunrise, a continental overview of current African affairs. With Russ Advocate Sipo Montula from the Tabumbeki African School of Public and International Affairs at UNISA. Sipo, good morning. Obviously a big focus on what happened in Rwanda 30 years ago, the genocide there. The President Paul Kagame, he's blamed the international community for part of it. Even very important that we so many African leaders descending to Chigali over this weekend to attend the 30 years of the commemoration of the Rwanda genocide, where we know estimated 80, I mean, 800,000 people were killed uh, during that genocide. We saw how France have already said that they, I mean, they were uh, supposed to have uh, protected the people of Rwanda. You find that the USA also in their delegation led by Bill Clinton saying that they should have also played their role in the prevention of the genocidal acts that were continuing to happen in Chigali in 1994. We saw even our president, Cyril Ramaphosa, being there, the Israeli president, Isaac uh, Herzog, being there as well. So it shows that even this was an important commemoration that started yesterday, and we know it was for 100 days between 7 April and 15 July, a very important milestone in the continent with the challenges that we face in the Middle East, the Rwanda genocide also, one will say, become that sign of understanding what happened in the continent and other regions of the world. And then the former head of Nigeria's central bank, the former governor in court today. That's true, Stephen. Remember that the Economic Financial Crimes Commission filed new charges on Friday, uh, allegedly saying that there were foreign exchange allocation of $2 billion that involved the former uh, central bank governor Godwin uh, in, in, in field. Now it is important last year you remember that Bola Tinubo suspended uh, the uh, central bank governor and placed him under detention. Now it appears that this case is beginning today as well and those charges are leveled by anti-corruption agency in Abuja.
And then um, in Senegal, the new Prime Minister, Osman Sonko, unveiling his government. Even almost in five ministers and five junior ministers, not a bloated cabinet if you look at the young uh, uh, Dio Maifai with Usman Sonko constituting the cabinet. What is important? Who's constituting the cabinet? I look at the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Yazin Fall, who was the vice president of their movement, Pastefa Party. Uh, finance they've given to Chase Diba, who was a bureaucrat in the head of budgeting of their movement. And also they've given some of the position to Diop, uh, who was the vice president of of the party who's now handling the oil and energy. Why oil and energy, Stephen, is because the Omaya fire, he wants to now nationalize uh, the oil and the energy sector in Senegal. He wants to also get rid of the CFA franc, which is the uh, French currency that Senegal has been using. And then in the DRC, another big, de- another big attack there on a village in the east. Stephen, it's not promising when you look at the DRC, despite you have a SADC mission, we have the Rwanda genocide commemoration. Uh, they, I mean, there have been some militia groups that have been attacking in Ituri region, Kodak and the Allied Democratic Forces. Uh, they've been attacking that the UN, um, as well as the government of DRC, they've been picking up the numbers, Stephen. It, it's really concerning when you look at the Eastern DRC with this current crisis of the civilian. We are picking up 25 civilians who were killed over this weekend in the eastern part of Congo. That shows a challenge to both the AU mission there and the current facing out of Munusku, out of the eastern part of the DRC. And as I said, the Rwanda genocide also had an implication to the current crisis that you still have in the eastern DRC. If one has to talk about the, those unfinished uh, conflicts in the borders of the eastern DRC as well as border in Rwanda. And then are you taking us back to this day, 1954? He's 70 years, Stephen is a poet, he's a teacher of uh, mathematics, he's from uh, Ali Dale in Kaibeha uh, in the Eastern Cape. Uh, we are talking of Vincent Oliphant, who was born on this day. Very important to go to ordinary people, Stephen, who are educators, who are poets, uh, that he started his poetry in the early 80s with a poem, I mean, with a, a book of poems that was entitled uh, Blood Flows in Silence and also come with a soft flesh in 1998. A very important educator, uh, Vincent Oliphant, who's turning 70 years today in our historical archives. Asante Sana LG is uh, still leading the conversation, SAFM observing the Freedom Month. Russ Advocate Sipa Mantulip, thank you very much indeed. Back again tomorrow. It has been over 20 years since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission issued its final report, recommending over 300 cases to be investigated or prosecuted. Truth Be Told tells the story of the TRC by looking at the poignant cases of the Pila Porsche Ndwandwe story, the Bekim Lanjene story, the Ntombi Kubeka story, the Topsy Madaka story, in which the truth has not been told and no one has been held accountable for their gruesome killings during apartheid. Channel your best South African documentary this March on Truth Be Told, Mondays at 9 p.m. only on... South Africa is facing an increase in people diagnosed with non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, cancers, hypertension, lung problems and obesity. This also increases the number of people living with these diseases and mental health. Many people living with these preventable diseases may not be immediately aware unless they go for health screening and testing. It is our responsibility to invest in our healthier future through regular physical activity, healthy diets and avoiding risky health behaviours such as alcohol and tobacco use. The Department of Health urges people to go for regular health screening for early detection and effective treatment if they are diagnosed with any of these conditions. This message is brought to you by the National Department of Health. Banyana, banyana. African champions and top 16 team in the world are in action on Tuesday the 9th of April at the Loftus Fansfall Stadium at 7.30pm. They are on the road to the Paris 2024 Olympic qualifiers as they face Nigeria for the last spot in the Olympics. Join us to hashtag fill up Loftus. Tickets are available at Ticket Pro at 50 Rand for adults and 20 Rand for children under 12 and scholars in uniform. You can also watch the match live on SABC Sports on DTT Channel 4 at 7 p.m. For more details, visit Safa.net and Banyana underscore Banyana on X. First in the morning, SAFM Sunrise with Stephen Grutis. Just going to quarter to seven, you know the number 086-000-2032. The political party COPE, the Congress of the People, launching their election manifesto over the weekend in Hamans Kral. COPE, as you know, has had uh, problems with internal disputes, seen its support drop dramatically to just one seat in places like Joburg. The acting general secretary at the Congress of the People is Eric Mokhlapa Masri. Eric, good morning. Thanks for your time. 
Good morning, Stephen, and how are you? I'm well, thanks. What are the main points of your manifesto? The main points of our manifesto is to prioritize sustained economic growth, to reduce the size of government and tackle the national debt, undertake the electoral reform, uh, reform municipal governments, uh, increase quality and quantity of middle class family, uh, social justice redistribution, township and rural uh, economic development, uh, youth employment skill and skills development, and uh, the last uh, the last one is uh, strengthen accountability and professionalize the state and then fight crime and corruption. So okay. those are the 10 points that we'll be looking at. How would you grow the economy? Everyone says they want to grow the economy. How would you do it? Our approach as far as growing the economy is as follows. You know, we focus on providing full and su- on support to advanced manufacturing helping secure investment in technology and harnessing the nation uh, the nation's resources to drive innovation and competitiveness in our in our manufacturing sector we roll out the joint public and public uh, public and private sector support infrastructure projects throughout the country particularly in transportation energy water and digital infrastructure we also support the local industries, especially those in local manufacturing and agriculture and value-added production to create jobs and boost economic resilience. Okay. And we'll also substantially increase the size of the employable uh, workforce. Targeted employment programs with private sector and uh, NGO support and increased avenues for occupational training. And okay. skills development. Eric, I mean, it all sounds, I mean, all political party manifestos sound very good, but you as COPE have been losing support over the elections. Um, I mean, you're facing more competition than you've ever faced just because there are more parties. Is this going to be COPE's last election? Do you really think you'll be going back to Parliament after this? I think uh, Congress of the People has now gained stability. You know, we had uh, some uh, internal challenges, you know, that we were faced with, but we were pruning ourselves as, as an organization. And now we have developed our own leaders within the Congress of the People, and we believe that now the leaders that are here, we are now stable, because those that were there before us had challenges here and there, but now we are now a formidable force and united force to grow the Congress of the People. Um, is Musiwa Lakota still your leader, isn't he? Yes, Musiwa Lakota is still our leader through these elections. But, you know, we'll be going to the Congress in order to choose a new president okay. after, this, uh, after this election. Okay, so he was your, you was your first leader. He was your leader in 2009, although you had a different presidential candidate for reasons uh, too complicated to get into now. Um, so now he's been your leader since 2009. He's still your leader in 2024. And you're asking people to vote for a political party when you're probably going to change the leader after the election. Yes. You know, he has been a leader all throughout. And uh, we... we and there has been challenges, you know, because, you know, people are contesting for power and and leadership. So now all what we can say is that uh, there, we, there is going to be a change of leadership because uh, uh, the Musiwa Lekota term has come to an end. And so uh, it's, it's going to be, it's, he's had these two terms. And then uh, now after this, uh, the, Congre- uh, the Congress will be having a new leader. That's basically what our constitution is saying. All right, Eric, thank you very much indeed. Eric Mwaklapa Maswi is the Acting General Secretary at the Congress of the People. 11 minutes now to 7. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Good morning. Very heavy on the N1 coming out of Pretoria to uh, towards Joburg through Midran this morning. Two incidents. One is a crash between Castfontaine and Rigel. Uh, that, uh, excuse me, that traffic's backed all the way through to the uh, N4. In fact, uh, just working back beyond the N4, back to Storemfall. So that's heavy. And then there's a breakdown near New Road, plus the uh, Monday volume. So from John Foster, Brockfontein interchange area, all the way through to that obstruction in the left lane on your way to uh, New Road. Very heavy. Uh, big traffic in from the south as well. Bit of rain this morning. R59 is heavy through Albert into Reading interchange. N- Three queuing up, uh, passing Spreadview to Heidelberg Road. The N12 in from Lanasia uh, for a turn through the bend up towards uh, Devlin Heavy, and the Mike One already backlogging from sort of Uncle Charlie's N12 uh, right through to Empire Road. It is heavy for motorists coming in from the south. Uh, Durban side this morning M7 queuing down to Bel Air Wakesley as it does on a daily basis. Uh, there's some traffic pressure out of Kumashu this morning, both Queen Nandi Drive and the Kumashu Highway. Both of those routes are heavy uh, heading through down towards the M2. Uh, bus crash at Escort South.
that has been cleared. If you're on your way out of um, uh, KZN, on your way to Kaoteng, that uh, big backlog has made its way through. Cape Town pockets are flooding as the rain continues. 35th Avenue is underwater at Bishop Lavis. There's also no traffic lights just back a bit on 35th Avenue, Stellenbosch Arterial and Robert Sabukwe. So some real pressure there. And it looks like the lights are out on the M7 Jakes curve. That some more Michelle. Some really heavy traffic that side of Mitchell's Plain uh, trying to get up towards uh, Philippi. And with closure of Baden Powell Drive at Kailicha and at Coastal Park, it means a lot of extra traffic pressure on Spine Road and uh, Strandfontein Road in the Strandfontein area. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. Big stories of the day. Hashtag SAFM Sunrise. Nine minutes to seven, the time of the Public Servants Association say they believe workers do deserve more than the increase they're getting from government this financial year. And an agreement signed last year, workers are getting an increase of 4.7% based on the current inflation rate. Some people have said publicly they don't believe workers deserve the increase because they're not productive. And you'll know the claim has been made consistently that workers in government are not doing enough to actually get increases. Ruben Maleka is the general manager of the Public Servants Association, assistant general manager. Excuse me, Ruben, good morning. Uh, good morning, SG. Uh, good morning to the listeners of SAFM. You obviously disagree with the, ca- the claim that public servants don't deserve an increase. Can you prove that government workers are productive? Yes, of course, government uh, workers are productive. We know that the general problem in South Africa is the, is the fiscal constraints. And while there's the fiscal constraints, everybody wants to blame public servants. But if you look at the general way that public servants deliver their service, it's exceptional. The, uh, the, the hospitals, the teaching profession, look at the pass rate last year of, of the public uh, schools in this country. That is attributed to the public servants. The general way that public servants work uh, in the home affairs, you can see the service delivery is there. It's unfortunate that the government at this point in time, the government vacancy rate is at 40% rate. So it is also affecting the rate at which public servants can also uh, you know, deliver their service exceptionally. Because if you've got 40% uh, vacancy rate, you expect that public servants will be constrained. The police service is constrained because from 2010, there's been reduction of uh, you know, the foot soldiers in the, in the police force. Therefore, they've been also defeated by criminals. But we have seen now government have started to annually increase some of the police officers. And that tells you that it is because the vacancy rate is high in the police force. The vacancy rate is high in, also in the hospitals. Okay. We have seen recently most of our doctors in Peter Marisberg were on protest. Why? Because the doctors are unemployed and it continues that hospitals suffer because sure. there are less of you know, doctors in the hospitals. Okay, so Ruben, I mean, you talk about vacancies, fine. But I think the problem that you face in terms of trying to win the battle for public opinion is this. If you go into a government office, if you go to a driver's license centre or something, you'll see a long queue. When you finally get to the front of the queue, you'll see people in the back of the office laughing. They're having a good time. You've spent your entire day queuing to get to this point, and not all of the telling places uh, will be manned. It doesn't look like people are working. You'll come out, maybe you get your driver's license, maybe you don't, and you'll see headlines about how those same people that you saw doing nothing in the back office have also been taking money through corruption. And isn't that the experience that millions of South Africans have when they go to a government office? It's not a general... Uh, you know, event that you find that when most of the public servants when you go to the office, you'll find them laughing in the background. In, in the, in my fund, there are reasons, and I've noticed that in many instances we tend to bring public servants whenever there are other situations. Maybe what is lacking is the communication, because if you go, for instance, I know instance in home affairs where. Uh, some of members were being attacked by the public, thinking that they are just sitting and laughing, not knowing. Is because of the systems that are down. And when a system is down, there's nothing that you can do at the road traffic department. There's nothing you can do at home affairs. And the victim remains who? They remains the members because they are not capable of doing but, any IT work and they are finally being blamed to say that they are sure. sitting around. But, but Ruben, you, you talk about communication. I mean, how many times do you go to a government office and there's terrible communication because your members are not managing the situation properly? You find that everybody needs to go to information because there isn't just a proper sign saying start here half the time. I mean, these things are simple. They're under the control of your members. 
Look, they might be under the control of members, but remember the rotation of, of the public that comes in comes out. So you might find that there's a communication that went out in the morning to say, um, you know, this particular service station is out of order. There's, there's no uh, service that will be rendered. And as public, uh, public come in, because they don't get that particular information consistently, they get frustrated. You might get that information quite after some time. Then, then that you realize that you have been on the queue for a long time. And that is why I'm saying there could be improvement of technology to communicate, to say, uh, don't come to this particular station. This day, this, this problem of this, uh, this challenge. Then it's just, the about, would know. just about putting up a sign, Ruben. It's not hard. It's really not hard. Look, that is what I'm saying, to say that there might be another means to say that let's communicate better in, in the public service, to say let's use technology, because technology is the way of communicating these days, where people are able to access information and know that let me avoid. Like now you do with uh, traffic, uh, the way you put it in the in SAFM uh, uh, through ROP. I want people to say, look, come, don't come this way. Today we've got a problem of this nature in this particular workstation. This traffic department has got this particular challenge. And that is the improvement that must, needs to be managed going forward. But it's not a general, uh, percep- that general perception that public servants are not doing uh, their work uh, optimally is wrong. Public servants in South Africa are working very hard and are overworked but, and underpaid. And that is the situation that we see with many public servants that leave the public servants, public service to private sector, on also overseas. Because why are nurses going overseas? Why are the trained, skilled police officers leaving the uh, the police service and joining private security? It's because public service is undervalued and it's overworked and it's it's underpaid. Ruben Maleka, thank you, Assistant General Manager at the Public Servants Association. The public Service Association. Uh, do you agree with him? Three minutes now to seven. SAFM 104 to 107 nationwide. Well, we're now in day 12 of no load shedding. In other words, we haven't had load shedding from Eskom for almost two weeks. At the same time, the energy regulator Nursa approving a new load shedding system that includes up to stage 16 in a major emergency. Professor Samson Mampwedi is an energy expert and head of the Department of Science and Innovation of the Energy Secret- Secretariat at Sanedi. Professor Samson Mampwedi, good morning to you. So 12 days without load shedding. Obviously, this doesn't mean load shedding is over. Yes. Uh, good morning, Stephen and the listeners. Uh, yes, um, I've looked at the, the, the system. Um, it's not um, that heavily constrained. That's why we, we don't have uh, load shedding for the, for the past uh, 12 days. Um, but we, we still have um, high levels of um, breakdowns. So we still expect that uh, at some point um, load shedding will come back. Um, however, there, there's also uh, some work that was done by, by ESCOM in terms of uh, the maintenance. Some of the units came back uh, to life, um, uh, to service. Um, uh, that's why we see uh, a reduction in, in load shedding. Even the, the, the maximum demand, I think the last time I checked, it was sitting at, uh, it was peaking at about 24, 25 gigawatts. Uh, which is uh, also helping in terms of um, us not having load shedding. And then um, when we look at a a regulation that would allow up to stage 16 of load shedding, does it not become a little bit meaningless? Because we know, for example, um, in Joburg, uh, City Power can't really manage and keep to time uh, anything above stage 4. There are just too many areas that need to be switched on and off all the time. I mean, when you get to stage 16, isn't it all a bit meaningless? Yeah, so so I need to to indicate that uh, uh, there are issues that need to be explained here. Uh, one, uh, NERSA approved the code of um, uh, uh, of practice. Um, so what happens is that there's a code of practice that then uh, uh, gets submitted by the National Rationalized Certification Association, which is a voluntary association that has got ESCO municipalities and the uh, large uh, power consumers and all that. Um, So what they did uh, is is that in the revised um, uh, document, they then uh, worked on schedules, load shedding schedules, beyond uh, stage 8. In the past, they used to do uh, schedules up until stage 8, because beyond stage 8, then there are other issues that need to be considered. They used to leave that to ESCOM. And and some of the issues that need to be considered is basically to look at 
the system network uh, and the system frequencies, uh, the the issues around islanding of uh, of some of the areas to 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 avoid uh, the, you know much higher demand coming into the system and all that. So what they did now was to basically. Uh, uh, work on a schedule that goes up to stage 16 load shedding. So when uh, NERSA approved, they're not approving necessarily stage 16 load shedding, they're approving the code. And and and, and that then means that um, uh, it gives a guide, a guide to ESCOM to say, should the system mm-hmm. get to a level where we have system emergency, when you consider all the other options that you have, uh, and and if those options fail, this is the schedule that you need to use going forward. We don't expect that we will go beyond stage eight load shedding anytime soon. Actually, we don't expect that we will ever go to stage eight, beyond stage eight mm-hmm. load shedding, uh, because Estom has got various other avenues mm-hmm. that they use to avoid uh, that that particular stage. Professor Samson Mampwedi, always appreciate the time. Thank you. You with SAFM seven o'clock. In our top stories, disaster committee activated in the Western Cape and police minister issues a strong warning to criminals. Good morning. The Western Cape Premier Alan Windy says a disaster coordinating committee has been activated following severe weather conditions in the province. He announced that schools will be closed today in the Overberg, Cape Winelands and Halderberg amid warnings of heavy rainfall. Storms are expected to accompany the rains. Windy says emergency services are on standby across the province. Our teams are out across this province. We'll be dealing with closing off roads uh, to remove danger. But we are going to be expecting a fair amount of rain. So please, if you're traveling, try and avoid passes. Try and avoid bridges and uh, crossings of areas that could be flooded. That is what we need to be doing. But our officials will be out on the road making sure that we are protecting you wherever necessary. Meanwhile, the South African Weather Service has forecast severe thunderstorms and strong winds across the central and southern parts of the country today. It has issued a warning for localized flooding in Gauteng. Forecaster Tukelo Chilwane. Expecting a 60% chance of showers and thunder showers in Gauteng with a possible uh, level 2 warning for disruptive winds over the southwestern parts of Gauteng. Police Minister Becky Kele has sent out a strong warning to criminals who refuse to surrender to law enforcement officers, saying their days are numbered. He was addressing the media in Pretoria yesterday on the successes of the Operation Chanela. Kele says police have had success in cases involving violent crimes, leading to the arrest of over 500,000 suspects since May last year. He warned that police officers will not hesitate to protect themselves and communities against criminals. Police remain unapologetic in their aggressive and decisive response to crime. We'll forever welcome the arrest of criminals and for them to have their day in court. But criminals are warned that if they engage the police instead of surrendering themselves, they will come out short. Police will continue to protect communities and push back hard on criminality. Not on our watch will allow criminals to walk all over communities and certainly not the country's law enforcement. Police in the Northern Cape have arrested 300 people. Over 100 of them were arrested for evading court appearances. In an operation at the weekend, officers nabbed suspects for crimes including murder and rape. Police spokesperson Timothy Sam. Operation Chanela remains focused in clamping down on crime in the province. This is evident in the weekly arrest and police actions executed since Monday. The focus on the reduction of contact and violent crime in crime hotspot areas, which netted 300 suspects. 177 suspects were apprehended and arrested. 124 daily wanted suspects were traced and brought to book for evading court appearances and contravention of court orders. 
And finally, the BBC has found that hundreds of Rohingya Muslims have been conscripted in recent weeks to fight for Myanmar's armed forces. Rohingyas are denied citizenship and were subjected to what the UN called textbook ethnic cleansing by the military in 2017. But the junta in Myanmar now wants their help to fight opposition forces and ethnic insurgents. The BBC's Jonathan Head reports. Military officers have been forcibly recruiting Rohingyas from the IDP camps, where around 150,000 have been confined for the past 12 years. Rohingyas are officially viewed by the military as illegal settlers with no right to live in Myanmar. Now they're being forced to fight for the military junta which seized power in a coup three years ago as it continues to be driven back by an increasingly confident and effective armed opposition movement. Some Rohingyas have gone into hiding to avoid being sent back to the front line. Recapping the top story, the Western Cape Premier Alan Windy says a disaster coordinating committee has been activated following severe weather conditions in the province. He announced that schools will be closed today in the Overberg, Cape Winelands and Helderberg amid warnings of heavy rainfall. For SFM News, I am Anne Musa. A very good morning to you. This is SFM Sunrise Sports Headlines. First up, rugby. The Blitzbox elevate their game to finish sixth at the Hong Kong Sevens. An impressive climb from their previous outing. And South Africa's Dean Burmester triumphs at Live Golf Miami, marking his first victory on the tour. All this and more just before 7.30. SAFM. The guiding you through the rush hour traffic. You're driving in from the airport at Joburg towards uh, Joburg, towards Gelulis, He's trying to avoid the R24. There are two uh, truck crashes, one after Barber Road and one just before Edenvale. The traffic's all the way back uh, into the airport, back to the airport, back to the R21 split. So uh, side roads, local routes through Edenvale or down through Ilans Fontaine come into play as uh, routes that are open and, and flowing, if you like, through that region towards Joburg. Just avoid joining the R24, especially coming out of the airport or from the R21 off ramp towards Gelulis. It's a heavy backlog. Uh, the second of those scenes, the one closest to the Edenvale exit is basically blocking the entire R24 Joburg bound. A lot of pressure in from the south and uh, R59 up towards Michelle Avenue's heavy N3 at Spreadview. Uh, big uh, backlogs of traffic there as well today. If you're leaving Pretoria, just an update on the N1. It stays heavy. A crash between Carsfontaine and Rigel. Traffic's all the way back now to Storham Full Road. So if you're driving in uh, joining from Montana or coming through from Pumalani Plaza, it's a heavy one. Uh, Durban, the Kumashu Highway stays the route under pressure from Malandela Road all the way down through Doss Road on towards the N2 Highway. Anyway, M7 is a heavy one from Queensborough, bluffbound down towards Bel Air and Wakesley. And Cape Town, two big uh, traffic lights amongst a little bit of flooding and wet weather conditions this morning. Uh, M7 at Samora Michelle, so it's very heavy out of Mitchell's Plain onto that Philippi side. And 35th Avenue at Robert Sabuque, Stella Mosh Arterial, big junction at the top of the airport. Lights down there as well. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. SAFM Sunrise. A vivid start to your day. Eight after seven. Good morning. You're with SFM, SFM Sunrise. I'm Stephen Crutus. You, know, you might have heard that conversation with Ruben Maleka from the Public Servants Association. He says that people who work for government are productive. Is that your experience? You might want to book your spot now, 86 2032 because I don't know how you see it, but I mean, the reasons I asked, some of the questions I asked him about driver's license centers, uh, for example. We'll get you an update uh, for you on the situation with the weather in the Western Cape. Very, very difficult weekend for them. We'll speak to the Chief Director director for disaster management there there was a big fire the wind some of the videos coming out of the wind are just amazing of trucks being blown off bridges things like that we'll just see what we can sort of find out about that and if the videos are actually true sometimes you've got to uh, watch these things then the deputy president Paul Machatile he was talking about water over the weekend very very important um, and also uh, and I'll ask uh, maybe an ideologically difficult question but he seems to be very prepared to work with civil society groups uh, what about uh, Companies and corporations, uh, mining companies have said they would be happy to work with government and to provide water. In fact, one or two of them have gone so far as saying they think that's what's going to happen. You mediated conversation from 8.30, a little bit of a deep thinking one, about why we believe what we believe. To put it another way, the international battle for influence. You've seen how different countries, different companies try and influence you. They try and basically get in your mind and change your opinion. And we see this sort of most obviously when it comes to wars and things like that. But we'll talk about that from 8.30 with SFM 10 after 7. 
Channel your inner adventurer on Top Travel this Saturday night at 8.30 on S3 as Bez and Anesu are in Lompopo for tea with a rooibos-loving hippo named Jessica. Jumping off Hraskop Gorge in Pomalanga, Fez screams from the top all the way to the bottom. But standing at God's window will leave anyone speechless. That's Top Travel, the Saturday night at 8.30, repeat Sunday at 1pm on S3. African champions and top 16 team in the world are in action on Tuesday the 9th of April at the Loftus Fansfall Stadium at 7.30 p.m. They are on the road to the Paris 2024 Olympic qualifiers as they face Nigeria for the last spot in the Olympics. Join us to hashtag fill up Loftus. Tickets are available at Ticket Pro at 50 Rand for adults and 20 Rand for children under 12 and scholars in uniform. You can also watch the match live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4 at 7 p.m. For more details, visit Safa.net and Banyana underscore Banyana on X. Big stories of the day. Hashtag SAFM Sunrise. 11 after 7, good morning in the Western Cape. The Premier, Alan Windy, ordering some schools to be closed in certain regions. In other places, people are trying to assess the damage after intense storms and really strong winds there. So schools in Overberg, the Cape Winelands, Helderberg, they're closed. There's also that big fire in Glencoe in Cape Town over the weekend. Colin Diner is the Chief, Desa- is Chief Director for Disaster Management in the, in, in the Western Cape. Colin, good morning. Thanks for your time. Good morning, Stephen, and good morning to your listeners. Firstly, what kind of situations have you had to deal with over the weekend and this morning? Yeah, so, Stephen, I think the, the big crisis yesterday was the kind of prefrontal system that we had with the wind coming in. So, you know, our fire season is sort of like just ended. We generally work until the end of March. But uh, we started getting quite a lot of fires, as you mentioned, in the, in the southern peninsula, the Glencoe, uh, Clovelly, uh, Fishuk area. And then we also had quite a couple of major fires in Stellenbosch up in the Galkenstein area, so much so that we had to uh, declare what we called a code red, which means that all our resources were depleted there, so we needed to send resources from other places. And then there's been a lot of wind, very high wind, um, measuring around 150 uh, kilometers an hour winds in uh, up near uh, Longabon, Soldana, that area. Uh, we've had a lot of roofs blown off. Uh, trees uh, have been uprooted. Um, informal settlements. We had a very large fine time Monday in Stellenbosch. So it's been, you know, all over. We have had uh, multiple incidents. The rain came in last night. Uh, it's been raining steadily ever since. The big area that we're concerned about, the Overberg. I just spoke to Overberg, head of disaster management, about an hour and a half ago. He says they've had about 40 millimeters, but we are expecting uh, quite a severe rainfall to come now through the day. Are there still ongoing incidents? Are there still people who need emergency help at this stage? I mean, I realise this moves minute by minute. Yes, there are. So we do have uh, we do have our emergency services, you know, spread quite wide. There was a lot of planning done uh, when we got the preliminary kind of warning on Friday, which was for a level six across the province. We got a call Saturday morning indicating that it'll be a level nine. So that just meant that we needed to increase resources. Um, there are ongoing incidents. I know there were three accidents, uh, not major accidents, uh, on the N2 overnight. There have been uh, accidents, uh, the N2 incoming one of the lanes into the city was closed because of an accident. And we are still continuously receiving messages of damages to buildings, etc. So, you know, you, you just have a very wide area that you need to have resources responding continuously. And obviously, for someone who's had their roof blown off and now you have intense rain, 40, mil, 40 mils of rain's a lot. I mean, that's very, very miserable. So people might need some longer-term help for the next week or so. Yes, absolutely. And so what we do is we activate our provincial disaster management center and we have what we call different clusters. So we would have a, a rescue cluster. We'd have a uh, you know cluster that looks after business. And then we also have a humanitarian cluster, which includes people like our partners, uh, Gift of the Givers, Lions Club, uh, organizations like that uh, who come in and they form part of it working under our social development department. So we've already actually deployed Gift of the Givers to Kaiamundi. It's just been very difficult there because with all the wind, you know, with shacks burning down and you've got a lot of debris across the, the, the area, it's been really dangerous there. We actually had an injury there on Sunday as well. 
Um, you talk about, I mean, winds of, did you say, 150 kilometres an hour. I realise this was a special weather system, a cut-off low. Have you ever had winds like that before? Stephen, I think the worst that we had before was, you probably recall in 2017, when we had a cut-off low like in June, and that caused those Nasna fires where we lost 900 formal houses. So that, you know, speaking to the people in, in the disaster centre, a lot of them were involved in that incident, and they are saying that they're seeing the kind of winds now that we saw over that period. So, you know, you've got to take these seriously, especially with the mountain passes. And maybe just one other little thing, you know, because of the very busy wildfire season we've got, we've got a lot of ground cover that was destroyed. So, uh, you know, um, landslides could become quite an issue and, and we are keeping our eyes open for that. Colin Dynap, thank you very much indeed. Chief Director for Disaster Management in the Western Cape. Very difficult there this morning. Quarter past seven. Big stories of the day. Hashtag SAFM Sunrise. There was a series of comments by the Deputy President, Paul Mashatile, published in the Sunday Times newspaper yesterday, in which he said he wants government to work with farmers and civil society groups like Afri Forum to deal with our water problems. He says he wants to depoliticize water. As you know, many parts of the country have had huge problems or have huge problems with providing water. Even big metros like Etiquini and Joburg, then there are places like Hamanskral. So many issues in so many different places. And at the moment, Randwater has been taking more water out of the Val Dam River system than the amount it is allowed to take out or it's licensed to take out by national government. The political advisor and spokesperson for the Deputy President, Paul Mashatila, is Keith Causa. Keith, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. What is the Deputy President proposing? What kind of plan would he like to see to sort out our water problems? Yeah, we, we haven't reached a stage where we have a blueprint of what needs to be done to solve the water problem. But what we can say is that the process has been set in motion since the president appointed him to lead the trust team that would look at water cutting across a number of departments. The idea is really to amass as much, uh, as much knowledge as possible in government uh, from the uh, line function departments and use them to come up to, to, to work towards a solution in partnership with the private sector. The idea is really to to look at where the problem is, what sort of solution do you need, what can government do and what can the private sector do to try and fix that. When you so so yesterday the conversation was around civil society groups. Are you saying you would also work with the private sector in terms of formal companies? Yeah, what we're going to do is we will be consulting broadly. There are a number of uh, companies that have registered their interest to work with government. But as you would know, we do have processes within government on how to engage the private sector. And we would still be using those approaches to ensure that uh, we comply with legislation and regulations uh, on how people can play a role. But what is important is that... uh, it does look like these groundswell support to avert any crisis on the waterfront. Um, I mean, the CEO of Sariti Resources, Mike Tika, said in February that he believed companies, mining companies like his, would probably be involved in providing water to councils at some point. I mean, that's the kind of company that would have the resources that already works with water that you'd be looking at. Yeah, it is, it is companies that are already in the space that have... Uh, proven solution on uh, assisting with water. As you would know, uh, the the alternative in terms of desalination is highly expensive. So we're looking at cost-effective measures, but we're not limiting ourselves so that we will see what is required and whether the the government has would be able to address that problem in terms of what it is required. We've seen in electricity, and I mean the analogy with electricity, I know the Deputy President made it as well, and you've made it now, we want to avoid any kind of water shedding like we've had with load shedding. But we've also seen with electricity a greater role for the private sector, in other words, private sector suppliers of electricity. Are you looking at something that would see private sector suppliers of water as well? Yeah, well, we we don't want to jump the gun at this stage. Uh, We want to engage them and see what they're putting on the table. 
and, and contrast that with what government can do and contrast that with what it costs us to do it and what the costs they come with and see whether it is feasible to, to, to do that. But the reality is that uh, the, your farmers, your mining, human settlement and so on, uh, they do require lots of water. And uh, it would require some partnership of sorts to be able to deal with the problem. The Minister of Water Affairs and Sanitation, Senator Mkunu, we've spoken, you, we've heard from him quite quite often on SAFM. Is he on board with all of this? I mean, is the Deputy President um, discussing this with him regularly? Yeah, well, the, the test to members is the Department of Water, COCTA, Safety and Security, Agriculture, uh, the mining sector and so on. So all those affected parties are from part of the of the task team that has been set up. Okay. Keith, it seems to me, I'm not an expert on the subject, but it seems from what I can see, the big problem is going to be local government. It's going to be councils, and you've got Cogta on your team, but the problem is going to be councils because constitutionally they play a very big role in providing water. And we know that governance in many councils, not all of them, but in many councils is very bad. And this is really the problem. So would you look at then reducing the legal power that councils have in this space. And I don't know if you could really do that because in the end, the water that comes into your house and my house comes from a council. It doesn't come from a province. It comes from a council. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we have to look at the role of the, what council, councils are playing, particularly companies within local government that are working with water, like your water supply entities, your rent water, Johannesburg water, Mahali's water. You look at their capacity, what they're able to do in partnership with councils. And the idea is also to differentiate and, and or separate. You look at water that is destined for households and you look at water that is utilized by big companies like mining, like agriculture and so on. What sort of, sort of sources are you looking at and who is more competent to assist in ensuring that they have access to water? Uh, the deputy president says he wants to depoliticize water, and I think it would probably be hard to argue against that. Um, but is it possible to do? I mean, isn't water going to be used as a political issue, A, by opposition parties, and then B, involving the private sector in providing water is an intensely political thing? Well, uh, I understand what you're coming for about it being political, but the idea is look at it as we're looking for solutions we don't want to play politics about it who can you know in terms of party political arrangement we're saying the country needs water how best we get water and how best we get it to where it's supposed to be addressing the issues of reticulation storage of water purification of water and so on so it is, a, it is an issue that we want to focus more on the technical side of its performance as opposed to what it means politically. Keith Kosa, thank you. Political advisor and spokesperson for Deputy President Paul Mashatila, 23 minutes after 7, you with SAFM. Professor Anthony Turtons, a professor at the Centre for Environmental Management at the University of Free State, also an expert on water. Professor Turton, good morning to you. So we have now a proposal from the Deputy President to involve uh, NGOs, civil society, and it would seem mining, private companies, and farmers in dealing with all of this. Is this the right approach? Do you think it's going to lead to anything actually changing in our water sector? Yes, good morning to you, the listeners. Um, I think it is uh, to be encouraged because it's a step in the right direction. Whether it's enough is an open question uh, because you know, the assumption is that uh, all you need to do is just, uh, for example, parachute in a couple of skilled people and it's all going to go away. But whereas in reality, if we do a root cause analysis, we are actually dealing with institutional failures. Uh, so institutions are about the processes, the decision-making processes, and the allocation of, of resources, most notably uh, uh, money, uh, in, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to sustain the supply chain. So supply chain management and procurement lies very much at the heart of this. And that's not just a, a human skills issue, that's actually a legal issue. Uh, in fact, it's a criminal issue because in many cases, uh, we're dealing now with, uh, with corrupt practices. So uh, I think it's uh, certainly it's to be welcome that the private sector would be involved. Uh, I'm part of the SA Business Water Chamber, and their whole role is to 
uh, uh, work with uh, companies on the water supply chain side. So, so this is music to uh, to their ears, most certainly. But uh, there's no way that the private sector would get involved until such time as the rule of law has been reinstated. And that, and to reinstate the rule of law means that you have to clean out the supply chain management or the procurement process, because that is where your your misallocation of resources takes place, and that's where the the the, the roots of corruption that have destroyed the, the water sector, that's where they uh, have taken hold. It would be surely incredibly political to have a bigger role for the private sector in the provision of water. Um, and as the, the Constitution is very clear about water, not so clear about electricity, but it's clear about water, that water is a human right. I mean, that would presume then it would follow that you would think that government has to ensure that there is a supply of water. Yes, I think we must not look at these things in binary uh, through a binary lens. It's not just one or the other. Yes, water is a human right. So we call that water as a social resource, uh, or wiser. Uh, um, sorry, where water water is an economic resource, or water is a social resource. Uh, it's actually both. Uh, there's a there's a thing called wiser. W i s e r. Water is both a social and an economic resource. And uh, you know, when we look at through a binary lens, we tend to lose sight of the reality. And the other thing that I would also like to challenge is the fact that uh, um, I don't I don't know why we are so hung up on the fact that the cost of desalination is alleged to be so high. This is factually incorrect. The cost of desalination globally benchmarked is now at 35 US cents per cubic meter. Now, 35 US cents per cubic meter is entirely affordable. And, and when we say affordable, affordable when measured against what? Uh, when measured against day zero? Uh, in a city, a coastal city, and what are the implications of that in terms of job creation, economic stagnation, etc. So, you know, we've got to get real about these uh, these technologies because the world is busy transitioning uh, to, a, to a fundamentally water-constrained situation. It's not only in South Africa, it's also other parts of the world. And uh, there's just one other thing I'd like to say, that when we talk about private sector involvement, it doesn't necessarily mean privatization of water. It's not that at all. You can still have your, your, your human rights allocation for water, etc. But what it means is that you are strengthening the governance structures around the allocation of water and particularly the management of financial resources needed to sustain that. And that's going to probably take place in the future to what is known as special purpose vehicles. And what a special purpose vehicle does is it brings the, uh, the Companies Act uh, to plug hold some of the holes in the Municipal Financial Management Act. Because in the Municipal uh, Financial Management Act, uh, there is no such thing as fiduciary responsibility. So an executive decision maker making a, making a decision that eventually ends up in, a, in, in the pilfering of resources, there are no consequences for that. Whereas in the Companies Act, there are. That, 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 that executive goes to jail. So, so uh, until such time as that has been strengthened, uh, which is, this is an institutional process, uh, uh, and only when that has been strengthened will you start seeing private capital coming into the uh, water sector. Uh, but, but without doubt, there is a lot of private capital willing to go into to fund these things. Uh, but uh, it can only happen when the rule of law is being restored. And that starts ultimately, at the end of the day, the, the ground floor of that uh, mm. Of that uh, uh, escalator uh, is in fact cleaning up the procurement uh, process uh, within any of your SOEs or any of your of your government departments. Professor Anthony Turton, thank you, Professor at the Centre for Environmental Management at the University of the Free State. Twenty-eight after seven. This is SAFM Sport with Zai Khan. Zai, good morning. Good morning. The Springboks putting in a good performance, all seven of them. All se- yes, onwards and upwards for all seven of them, showing resilience and determination. Despite their less than stellar performance in Los Angeles, the team rallied and they finished in sixth place, a notable sixth place, a significant leap from their previous 11th. Let's listen to Blitzbok coach Philip Sneeman. If we can get everything right, I still believe between the top three or between at least in that semi-finals every single tournament. So um, even though we're shifting our focus a little bit to the um, qualifiers, our next goal will be top four in the next tournament, um, nothing less than that. And uh, then also in Madrid, the top four there, and then we can take confidence going into the qualifiers.
It was New Zealand who beat France to retain their Hong Kong Sevens crown. Elsewhere, some soccer action. Amazulu 1-0 winners over Cape Town City. Royal AM 3-2 was their win over Polokwane City at a cold, wet Harigwala Stadium. And Manchester United and Liverpool playing to a 2 all draw as Jurgen Klopp's side missed the chance to reclaim top spot, which is now held by Arsenal. Tennis action Matteo Berrettini beat Roberto Caballas Baina in straight sets to win his first title in almost two years. He eased past his Spanish opponent 7-5-6-2 at the Grand Prix Hassan II in the Moroccan city of Marrakesh. And golf Dean Burmester of South Africa won for the first time on the Live Golf League by closing with a 4-under 68 and beating Sergio Garcia in a playoff yesterday when the Spaniard hit the water on the second extra hole at Live Golf Miami. Burmester won won for the third time in the last five months. He won the Joburg Open and the South African Open late last year, events co-sanctioned by the European and Sunshine Tours. Here's Burmester. I heard Sergio made a long putt. I mean, I had a cameraman. Do you want to know what Sergio did? Do you want to know? I said, no, I don't want to know what he did. <laughs> so, you know, just chipped it out. And But yeah, I went, I went to the putting green. My teammates, Brandon and Charles and Louis, are like, it's not over yet. He's hit it to like 60 feet. It's not over yet. Go hit some putts. So, yeah, I just went with my family and we all walked down onto the putting green and I hit a couple of putts and, and then obviously he missed it and it was like a little sense of calm kind of came over me and I was, I was ready to get business done. It was cool. And that's how we close that sport on Sunrise. We'll bring you more top of the hour. I am Zai Khan. Zai, thanks very much indeed. Well, a lot more to come in the next little while. We'll find out more about the ANC and the problematic candidates, people with findings against them from the Zondo Commission. That's to come. You're with SFM leading the conversation. Day 12 of No Load Shedding, 7.30. Good morning. In the headlines, the Mkuntu Esizwe party will today head to the Electoral Court to challenge the Electoral Commission's decision to disqualify the former President Jacob Zuma from standing for public office. Last month, the Commission notified the MK party that Zuma could not appear on its candidates list due to his previous contempt of court conviction. Management of the Stellenbosch Medic Clinic says strong winds have damaged the roofs of structures. It says this has affected operations in surgical and pediatric wards and Palestinians have started returning to what is left of their homes in the devastated city of Khan Yunus in southern Gaza after the withdrawal of Israeli troops. I'll have details on these and other stories at 8. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Here's a couple to avoid this morning. The R24 coming out of the airport, OR Tambo International towards uh, Gilili is really badly backed up. Got a truck crash here. In fact, there's two uh, scenes between uh, Barber Road and Eden Vale. Uh, as you come into the Eden Vale, lanes are limited coming into that Eden Vale exit. So uh, the traffic queue is back to the R21. If you normally swing off the R21 and pick up the 24 to Gilili's, uh, look for some alternative routes, either up through Kempton Park or down through sort of jet park areas this morning, and you'll get through quicker. The other big ones are the N1 South coming out of Pretoria, uh, crash between Castfontaine and Rigel. That traffic's all the way back to Montana. Uh, that is super heavy. Also, coming into Pretoria from the north, Montpody Highway to Esky and Pathali is heavy. And Paul Kruger from Mayville through Capital Park deep into CBD territory. So quite a big backlog going on there. Just an update uh, back to the N1 South problem between Castleton and Rigel. It's a big enough crash to also just be having an impact on the northbound. So uh, from Borta Avenue up to Castleton uh, is pretty busy. Uh, you've then got a breakdown on the Midrand section by Ollie Fonsfontein. So... Uh, that's heavy from Brockfontein Interchange side. Uh, Durban, one of the heavier mornings. So you'll sit on the M7 towards the Bluffords. So currently queuing deep into Queensborough Territory as you get down towards uh, Bel Air and Wakesley Territory. Uh, Cape Town, the closures. Well, Huguenot Tunnel is now open to all traffic. That's vehicles and uh, trucks. Trucks were allowed to flow through Huguenot Tunnel again from just after six this morning. Uh, Clarence Drive remaining closed between Gordons Bay and Royale. So that'll be a slow trip over Solari's Pass a long way round. And uh, also the uh, Glen Cam- and main road linking Glencan and Fishhook stays closed due to some mudslides. Chapman's Peak Drive uh, remaining closed as well. Two big traffic lights out of Cape Town, just north of the airport. Robert Subikwe, Stellenbosch Arterial. That's an absolute mess. And you've got M7 at Samora Michelle offline. So very heavy leaving Mitchell's plane as well. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. The Business Update on SAFM. With our business show host, Jimmy Muyaha. Jimmy, hi. Good morning. Asian markets, US markets, how are they all looking? Morning, Stephen. Uh, U.S. markets closed out the week in the green last week with Nasdaq up 1.2 percent, S&P 1.1 percent in the green and the Dow 0.8 percent. Asian markets are still mixed at this stage. Tokyo up 
two thirds of a percent. Hong Kong sitting slightly in the green, basically flat. Uh, South Korea up one uh, third of a percent, with Indian markets up half a percent. If we look at Chinese markets, they're down uh, about half a percent on the top 50. On the composite, uh, that's down three quarters of a percent. And if we look at Philippines markets, they're down uh, 0.8% at this stage. If we look at some commodities pricing, gold sitting $2,336 an ounce, uh, up about a third of a percent there. Copper prices are sitting down about two thirds of a percent with platinum and palladium prices currently sitting flat from where they were. The interesting developments here are around Around the Brent crude price, Brent crude coming back uh, briefly uh, towards that $90 a barrel level, uh, touching just below $90 a barrel uh, following the announcement or the developments in the Middle East that the Israeli Defense Force has decided to withdraw its troops from Gaza and the Rafa region. This obviously following the developments we heard from Iran uh, Iran throwing a spanner in the works, announcing that if there is an attack on Rafa, there will be a, re a response from Iran in the form of Iran attacking Israel. So that's bringing about interesting developments in the oil space. If we look at some currency movements, uh, the price of the dollar against the rand, 18 rand 71, uh, 20 rand 27 against the euro, 23, 63 against the British pound, the rand weakening against all three major currencies at the stage. But the dollar has been uh, recovering ever so slightly since those developments of last week. We saw that we got that jobs print from the US coming through stronger than expected, stabilized. Uh, the dollar prices there. If we look at some crypto moves, the price of Bitcoin, $69,573, uh, up about 0.4% at this stage. Price of Ethereum is up about two thirds of a percent uh, at $3,421. And then what's lying ahead this week? What can we look forward to? Uh, a couple of interesting things developing this week. Uh, starting with today in South Africa, we've got our net uh, foreign reserves data that's going to be coming out from the Reserve Bank. Now, that's important because we know that in the budget speech we had in February, the finance minister announced that we would be looking to tap into our gold and foreign exchange reserves currency account uh, to pay down some debt. So we're going to be looking to see how healthy those reserves are for the month of March, where we stand from that perspective, and potentially see if we can get some guidance uh, from the, whether the National Treasury or the Saab around where that puts us going forward. We've also got uh, US CPI this week. We've got Chinese CPI this week that'll both uh, be very important uh, data points. Uh, we know that China has been still going through deflation for the longest time, and we know that the US is going to be looking at this data point to see where it positions its rate uh, cutting cycle or when we start to expect to see uh, rate cuts, because at this stage, it looks as though we're still pricing them a little further out. So we'll have to keep an eye on those developments to see what's happening there. We're also keeping an eye on developments in Egypt. They seem to be going through a bit of a power crisis, having to import more LNG gas to sustain their economy, given the power cuts that they seem to be experiencing lately. Thank you very much indeed, Jimmy Miyaha. Of course, uh, back tonight on our business show, and uh, we'll hear from him again tomorrow. More business news through the day. Jimmy, thank you. 22 minutes to 8. Call us on 086-000-2032. All right, lots of calls coming through. Let's start with Sir Reetze in Limpopo. Sir Reetze, hi, public servants. You heard Ruben Maleka earlier. Good morning, Stephen, and good morning to the SAFM listeners. Look, Stephen, the function, the job of labor is to protect the employees, regardless of good things they're doing or wrong things they're doing. I'm telling you now, Stephen, at, at, at the, uh, the provincial department, for instance, they start working at half past seven. Mm -hmm. yeah? And now, I'm telling you, just go there now. Just go there now. You'll see they start dropping in at eight o'clock until mm -hmm. half past eight, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, just another example, Stephen. I went to one of the departments, the Department of Education, just next to the high court. <clears throat> I went there in the morning. At about nine o'clock, I found them around the table. You no, know, they bought food. They were eating, mm. chatting. I greeted them. You know, they just no one, uh, you know, responded. Mm. But the other one responded very late. Now the third one, the lunch time can be twelve o'clock, can be one o'clock. But let's speak about the one at one o'clock. They go for lunch at one o'clock, but what time do they come back? They are coming back at half past two yeah. at three o'clock. Yeah. You see, and. What's surprising is even the supervisors, 
Even the supervisors, they do the same. Stephen, mm. it's not true. You're quite right. There's no productivity there. Thank you. Yeah. All right, sir. Let's say thank you. I mean, I think that this is the problem, that, and this is why I put it uh, to Ruben Maleka in that way, that you know, uh, workers in the public sector can be their own worst advert. Churchill and Tata, how do you see it? <laughs> yes, Kevin. <laughs> You know, when you're talking about services, I, I, I just remember a situation that I was faced with. <clears throat> uh, I had a road traffic fine mm-hmm. for speed. Then uh, I went to the traffic department to to pay. When I got there, I was told by everybody. It's a huge department. There are many other departments there, yeah. but uh, there's no electricity. So they're not working. Mm. So I had to leave. Came back the seventh day, that was a due date for the ticket to be paid. Then after that, uh, a warrant was going to be issued for me. Yeah. They told me that the Department of Public Works has not paid. So the municipality has started to, uh, to, to, to switch them off. Sure. So obviously now I have a warrant. Yeah. So I you can't pay what you want to pay, and as a result now someone wants to arrest you? Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> That's the <a> situation. <laughs> Churchill. It's insane, man. Sheesh. All right, Churchill and Tata, thank you. I'm sorry to hear that. Insiki on the line from Etiquini. Hi. You want to talk about Nosavuma Peace and Gakula? Yes, yes. Good morning to you and to your listeners. In fact, I want to respond to a, a gentleman called Tami who phoned you on Thursday. Oh. Yes, Tommy was uh, uh, just uh, r- uh, help me if I get my memory correct here, Nsiki. Tommy was basically saying that we should um, treat everybody as if they're innocent until proven guilty and we shouldn't demand that they lose their jobs. Uh, I don't doubt that, but he was using guerrilla tactics against you. First, he came off with this uh, term of uh, uh, the principle of clean hands. Yeah. Yeah. Then he didn't build up on it. Then he threw the the term of prima facie evidence at you. And yeah. then he also didn't build up on that. Then he used the example of the late Ben Langer, who was uh, executed mistakenly because he had been set up by, by, by the security police. Now, I, I, I have no problem with, with the other two points, but he couldn't use the example of, of Ben Langer because he had not been, he had not been accused in a court of law. Mm. And he was only set up by, by the security police. And I'm only phoning to ask people to, to phone in and make their points, substantiate them, and not uh, uh, draw parallels with things mm. that have no relation to them mm. at all. So, thank you very much. And Tiki, thank you. You're saying we need to improve the quality of our argument. Exactly. Yes. All right. No, and Siki, thank you. Look, uh, the whole point of this really is to have good arguments, if you know what I mean. Thank you. Sazizo and Mpumalanga, hi. You want to talk about water and water provision in private companies? Yes. Morning, Stephen. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Uh, what the, the Deputy President is coming with is not new. Uh, public-private partnership has always been there. It's just that there's a lack of political will in, with the government. Yeah. Let's just understand that one. Yeah. Secondly, he needs, if he goes that route, he needs to understand the challenges that we are facing in the water sector. There's the issue of dams, mm-hmm. bulk storage. There's issue of bulk supply. There's issue of supplying, that is the network, which distributes the water to the users, yeah. to the municipalities. Then there's the issue of infrastructure. So if he, he must define where he wants these guys to come and play the role. Because for me... If you're just going to say partnership and then you don't define that, you're still going to get into the problems we have now. Mm. For, yeah. for instance, if you had to say, we're going to ask the private, the private sector to make sure that bulk supply is there, the, the, the distribution network is there, then for only the municipalities to do the billing, mm. that's a different story. Then you're going to have 99.999% availability of water. <laughs> because yes. the private sector says, you pay me based on the availability yes. of the offer yes. I'm offering. Yes. Then you can bill your users. Yeah. But if in between there will be municipality uh, involvement, forget to be, it's not going to work. It's all about municipalities in the end, isn't it, Sazizo? I mean, that's the problem. Yes, sir. All right. Sazizo and Pumalanga, thank you. Errol and Durban, hi. Uh, you want to talk about ministers? Hi, Errol. Yeah. Um, you know, what you said in your opening address to the nation, I mean, to uh, what's your... My um, opening address to the nation. I've never thought of calling it that, Errol, but I will now. <laughs> anyway, uh, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, I've always wondered, and I've, this is for a long time, why people who earn huge salaries stay in uh, palaces and drive expensive mm. cars 
and lead this type of life we always dreamed of, why do they want to risk their lives by by getting involved in corruption? Mm. Just for, say, 100,000 to yeah. make an extra million. I mean, they're taking a huge risk. They've mm. got everything. Mm. My brother says it's called greed. I don't know. Yeah, Errol, it's a very good question. I don't know. Um, but it happens here and it happens around the world, doesn't it? 16 minutes to eight. And we would buy 500 cars and we would buy 500 more. So sell your car for the best price and we won't think about it twice. We buy cars, we buy cars. The easiest way to sell your car by far. The boys of Steve Parker resist to leave the pitch without a ticket to the semis. But there's a big problem. Kevin Hunt's boys say the last dance of happiness belongs to them. This is the Netbank Cup quarterfinal battle. Stellies versus Matatanza Pitori. On Saturday, 13 April at 2.30 p.m. Live on SABC One and SABC Radio Stations. Also available on SABC Plus and SABC Sport.com. Hashtag, we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. For the love of the game. Conversations that you connect with and react to. SAFM. 14 minutes to 8 now. The time. Some reports over the weekend that uh, senior leaders in the ANC are looking at still removing four people who are actually on the party's candidate list or list of candidates to go to the National Assembly and Provincial Legislatures after the election. You may remember, of course, that some of the members of the NEC of the ANC, so Azizi Kordwa, Malusi Gagaba, David Machlobo, and Cedric Froelich, have findings against them from the Zondo Commission. Some of them, of course, are senior ministers. Can they still be removed at this time. Professor Susan Boyson is a political analyst. She joins us now. Professor Boyson, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. This whole debate in the ANC seems to go back and forth so many times. In the end, you've got the fact that the Zondo Commission made findings against these four people and others, but they do not at this stage face criminal charges. Why is it so difficult for the ANC to decide what to do next here? Yes, it is incredibly difficult for the ANC. These names have been flaunted for quite a quite a while now, and especially a month ago when we had the preliminary release of the lists. And the ANC clearly is trying to minimise the action against implicated um, cadres that are high in standing, and yet the charges not charges at the stage, these are important technical differences in the ANC, the allegations are there. In the case of these four, apparently, um, the ANC Integrity Committee had found against Froelich and Kodwa. And apparently Mashlova and Gagaba had not bothered to appear at the Integrity Committee. And so the ANC, a month ago, it was still deemed too divisive for the NEC to implement the recommendation by the top seven of the ANC that these four be taken off the list. Apparently now the pendulum has swung to the other side and it's now fine to act against them. It seems, if one can deduce from the context here, that the ANC is seriously receiving or oh, receiving part of the message from the public that corruption is very serious, incredibly serious issue for the public, and they want to see more done to it. It could also be that the ANC is looking for more um, to the future, to the immediate possible coalition's future, and saying that it would have to do more to persuade potential partners that it is a party that's serious about corruption. So there are so many technical internal process issues plus ANC power projections that come into this move. There's been a lot of talk about the party lists and of course there's this talk about MK and former President Zuma as well. But after the election, the parties don't necessarily have to stick to their candidate lists. People can become unavailable and all sorts of things can happen. There's still a bit of space, isn't there? 
There is indeed, there is indeed. And we also see in the reports over the weekend that the ANC stresses that any time in future, further people could be taken off if processes are concluded. And it is shown that they should not have been there in the first place. The ANC is really emphasizing that much can change. And we know that from politics in the past, those lists change um, quite, quite not, not frequently, but from time to time, yes. Also, for example, when suddenly there has to be a cabinet appointment and that person has not been in parliament, then some other parties and persons, individuals can get knocked off the list. So it is, it is the list is really a process. And we see here some preemptive action by the ANC. Um, so you talk about the technicalities of it and they can be important, but I think I wonder if for the ANC, the message that emerges to the public is quite inconsistent, almost muddled, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and there's this reliance mm-hmm. on people's own consciences to, you know, do the right thing. What I've never, and we saw this with Nusuf Vima Pisang Gakula, the former National Assembly Speaker as well, what I've never <laughs> understood is why someone who's done something wrong would suddenly have an attack of conscience and then step down. Yes, that is a million dollar question. Um, so few people would actually do that. We can look across the board in the ANC. We can think back of Gwede Mantash's 2017 report to the ANC conference when he was still ANC Secretary General talking about how endemic, systematic, pervasive co- corruption is in the ANC. And so the few that are coming forward and stepping aside or resigning, they are really few and far between. And I can imagine it must also have been prevalent in the former speaker's mind. There are so many around her in parliament they were, uh, and in the ranks of the candidates that have got skeletons, but uh, really the meanings, um, small and yana, um, in their closet and have not been doing anything about it. So it's reliance on that kind of conscience. In the case of these four that we see now, they are quite high level people and like Maslow, Boogie Gaba, et cetera. Mm with high high political ambition. And so it could be that there is now sufficient consensus in the NEC. Previously, the NEC had defended them and now sufficient consensus that they have to be taken out. But then in future... We don't know. They should they be should charges formal charges again against them continuously, consistently not to reappear. Then they could in future also still claim they find to be back in politics. And this is a tragedy of the ANC and ANC's candidate lists that there are so many gaps, so many question marks. It is such a big organisation. It has been such a big organisation, and they're always going to be the prettier ones and the ones that are really pulling the ANC down. And the ANC is such a fragile organization, so it has to maintain, it has for itself, it has to maintain the unity inside and not alienating people, not driving them in the, in the arms of the MK party, for example. Those are big considerations. And that is compromising power play, which has become synonymous with much of ANC operations. Professor Susan Boyce, and thank you, political analyst. Really appreciate it. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Well, the R24 remains heavy from the airport as you come out towards Galoolies. There's a truck crash, a truck ramping up on the barriers, multiple lanes closed uh, just before the Eden Vale exit. So very heavy if you're coming out of the airport or swinging off the R21 onto the R24 and you head down towards Galoolies. You do that on a daily basis or you're doing it the first time, uh, hit some alternative routes and uh, avoid the R24 westbound. Really is uh, badly backed up. Uh, the N12, a crash after Davyton down by Pitfontaine. So the N12 in towards uh, Benoni uh, stays very heavy backed up. A lot of pressure in from the uh, south as well. The R59 heavy up towards Michelle Avenue. N3 into Sprite View is really bad. The Heidelberg Road coming through uh, that N3 in towards sort of Alberton Territory bad as well. And further south, if you're on the R42 between Nigel and uh, Heidelberg, there's a delay there causing very heavy backlogs both ways. Uh, Route 1 remains a problem out of Pretoria to Joburg this morning. A crash by um, just after Castfontaine on the southbound side. It's a big crash in. Delays all the way back to Mont.
Montana. Uh, that's super heavy. Going northbound, this is backlog from Borta Avenue up through La Casse Fontaine uh, with the onlooking factor going on there. Also, collision on the N14, the Ben Schumann Highway on your way to Pretoria uh, by Gene Avenue. So some extra waiting pressures uh, heading up uh, in towards uh, Cap City as well this morning. Uh, Durban side, no traffic lights. Commercial Highway at the N2, so that's heavy. The M7 stays really badly backed up from Queensbury down towards Bel Air Wakesley. And two crash scenes coming off the south coast, one at the Munson Toti and one at Prospect. And so two queues to work through on your way up into Durban this morning as well. Cape Town, two big lights out in the uh, city environs. You've got 35th Avenue, Stellenbosch Arterial, Robert Sabuque out. There's some very heavy backlogging into that junction north of the airport. Uh, the uh, lights on uh, M7 at Samora Michelle are still down, so heavy out of Mitchell's plane. And a couple of closures, two big ones with uh, delayed impacts. Baden Powell closed, both at Monwa BC and at Coastal Park. But it's that closure from Strandfontein Road that's causing a lot of pressure in that Strandfontein area. And the main road that links Fishhook and Glen Can still close, so you'd just be facing some delays, particularly around the Glen Can Expressway as the alternative route. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. Big stories of the day. Hashtag SAFM Sunrise. Last year, the Mars Singer hit South Africa like a storm. This year, the Mars Singer South Africa returns with 16 huge celebrities hidden behind 16 humongous masks. Get ready to be amazed and astonished with brand new masks and performances that are going to blow your mind. Don't miss the biggest television event since <laughs> season one. The Mars Singer South Africa season two premieres on S3, Saturday 6 April at 6.30 p.m. For credible and comprehensive coverage of South Africa's fast-moving mining industry and the people shaping it, click through to Crema Media's Mining Weekly. From policy and innovation to market-moving trends, Crema Media's Mining Weekly keeps your finger on the resources pulse. For even deeper insight, subscribe to our New Look Weekly magazine out every Friday together with engineering news. Crema Media's Mining Weekly. Current. Credible. Comprehensive. Banyana Banyana. African champions and top 16 team in the world are in action on Tuesday the 9th of April at the Loftus Fansfall Stadium at 7.30pm. They are on the road to the Paris 2024 Olympic qualifiers as they face Nigeria for the last spot in the Olympics. Join us to hashtag Philip Loftus. Tickets are available at Ticket Pro at 50 Rand for adults and 20 Rand for children under 12 and scholars in uniform. You can also watch the match live on SABC Sports on DTT Channel 4 at 7 p.m. For more details, visit Safa.net and Banyana underscore Banyana on X. First in the morning, SAFM Sunrise with Stephen Grutis. Four minutes to eight now, the time. Well, you know how often we've had to talk about the awfulness of pit latrines at schools and the fact that so many children around the country, in particular schools, don't have access to proper toilets. In Limpopo, there are still major problems, despite a set of deadlines that had been set following legal action after the death of Michael Kamapa, who died in a toilet. I mean, he was just five. You remember that story. Kimberly Kumalo is a researcher at Equal Education. Kimberly, good morning to you. How many schools in Limpopo still don't have proper toilets? Uh, good morning, Stephen, and good morning to the listeners. So, um, as Equal Education, we know from the report that the latest report that the department has given that about 80 schools of the priority one schools, which are schools that solely re- rely on plain pit toilets, still don't have proper toilets. And some in some of those schools, construction has yet to start to give them proper toilets. But also there's a larger issue in that some schools have a mix of proper toilets alongside pit toilets. So um, a prior request done recently by Equal Education shows that about 1,900 of schools in Limpopo have a combination of pit pit latrine toilets alongside proper sanitation. So that's quite concerning as well. So in other words, I mean, it would seem that once the sanitation infrastructure allows you to do one proper toilet, to do all the rest proper toilets should be relatively cheap, right? Yeah, so uh, the, the the plan that the department has given really just states that all the schools, they are going to replace them with uh, EnviroLoose or ventilated and proof pit toilets. So it's not as though uh, they are starting from uh, nothing and not knowing what should be done. It's really frustrating that um, we are still seeing a lack of urgency in doing this when the department has had up to like 10 years experience in implementing um, the, the, this plan, right? Um, and 
another frustration that we have is that these deadlines through the court order are self-imposed, right? The department decided that 2023 in April would be their deadline. And it's frustrating that they're shifting their own self-imposed deadlines, but also not taking into consideration that there is a school infrastructure law that has already set clear deadlines, which are 2016 and 2020, um, that they've already missed. So it's quite frustrating seeing them really, mm-hmm. really nearly changing the deadline for when this should be done. I mean, the president made promises, I think, in 2018 about about this. Mm. Um, is there any explanation for why the education department, I mean, clearly it's spending money on this and it's clearly making some progress. Is it just not mm. spending enough money or does it not have enough money? So, um, as equal education, it's quite difficult for us to engage with the Limpopo Department of Education outside of the courts, right? So, we've written several letters to them that have gone unanswered. We've protested, as as as, as folks would know, like last year um, and the year before that, to the department to say, um, these are your deadlines, please meet them. So, it's quite difficult to engage them and see exactly where the pro- problem lies. But in their annual reports, they have stated... Um, uh, issues with funding. But what we've seen also is that they have uh, an issue with wasteful and irregular expenditure, the Limpopo Department of Education in particular. So we don't think that's, that, that's a, a worthy response to speak about not having enough funds when you're not spending um, the funds correctly. But also they've spoken about um, not having enough capacity um, to do everything that they should. But this also is not a very good argument because by this time, I mean, we are 11 years after the school infrastructure law has been promulgated. You must have learned some things along the way in order to um, implement your, your your legal obligations to learners and school communities um, widely. Kimberly Kumalo, thank you. Researcher at Equal Education with SFM, leading the conversation at 8 o'clock. In our top stories, MK Party to challenge exclusion of Zuma from candidates list and impact of severe weather in the Cape. Good morning. We start with election news. The Mkonto Sizwe party will today head to the Electoral Court to challenge the Electoral Commission's decision to disqualify the former president, Jacob Zuma, from standing for public office. Last month, the commission notified the MK party that Zuma could not appear on its candidates list due to his previous contempt of court conviction. The constitution stipulates that any person convicted of an offence and sentenced to more than 12 months imprisonment without the option of a fine is disqualified for from standing for public office. Zuma was convicted of contempt of court in 2021 for failing to appear before the Zondo Commission. The party spokesperson Tlamulo Ntlela. President Zuma was not incarcerated off the back of what would be Section 35 of the Constitution where you ought to be before a judge and have a fair trial. Uh, President Zuma was incarcerated by a constitution court uh, without having been afforded his constitutional rights to a fair trial. So um, we cannot necessarily label it as a criminal case. You know, he all he did was contempt of what would be contempt of court. And that is not a criminal case. It's more so a civil matter. Um, And the IEC Act refers to a criminal matter. The ANC Deputy President Paul Mashatile says his party is focused on seeking solutions to the country's energy crisis. He says there is an urgent need to ensure sustainable energy supply for the economy to grow and jobs created. Various senior ANC members accompanied Mashatile on a campaign trail in Haut Bay outside Cape Town. He responded to residents' questions on unemployment and poverty. We want to be a nation at work and a nation that is implementing plans that grow the economy and create jobs, we have to have a reliable, uninterrupted supply of energy, electricity. 
Management of the Stellenbosch Mediclinic says strong winds have damaged the roofs of structures. It says this has affected operations in surgical and pediatric wards. Three neonatal patients had to be transferred to an alternative hospital. Strong winds caused havoc across the Western Cape at the weekend. Trees were uprooted and houses as well as schools damaged. The Education Department has closed schools in the Boerland and the Halderberg Basin. The city of Cape Town has meanwhile called on the public to help with donations for victims of the gale force winds and fires in the metro and surrounding areas. Meanwhile, in the Free State, the Mukaka municipality says most of the schools in the residential areas are flooded following heavy rains and hail storms that hit Kruenstadt and Mount Queng. The municipal spokesperson says a joint operation committee will be convened to establish the extent of the damage that the heavy rains have caused. The municipal authorities have urged residents to avoid low-lying areas and submerged bridges. Palestinians have started returning to what is left of their homes in the devastated city of Khan Yunus in southern Gaza after the withdrawal of Israeli troops. The Israeli military's offensive has left most of the Aryans area in ruins. It says the soldiers have left to prepare for future operations. The Israeli Defense Minister Yov Galant has described the work of the military as commendable. The achievements of the forces that operated in Khan Yunus are extremely impressive, hitting terrorists, destroying enemy targets, warehouses, weapons, underground headquarters and control rooms. Hamas ceased to function as a military organization throughout the Gaza Strip. Recapping the top story, the Mukonto Esizwe party will today head to the Electoral Court to challenge the Electoral Commission's decision to disqualify the former president, Jacob Zuma, from standing for public office. For SFM News, I am Anne Musa. A very good morning to you in your SFM Sunrise Sports headlines. These Sharks, they triumph over the Zebra, securing a spot in the Euro Challenge Cup quarterfinals. And South Africa's own Dean Burmester clinching his first win in the Live Golf League. Stay tuned for more details just before 8.30. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Good morning. Just a reminder of the protesting northern suburbs of Joburg, Paulsoff area, Vic Hoppen and Main. It's all heavily backed up. A lot of traffic in from Lone Hill. A lot of traffic out of four ways into that Paulsoff area this morning. Uh, the N1 South coming out of Pretoria stays badly backed up. A crash between Castfontaine and Rigel. Uh, southbound into that. The traffic's extreme. It's all the way back to Montana. Northbound, everybody having a look. So from Boerta Avenue through to Castfontaine, it's pretty heavily backed as well. Uh, crash on the N14, the Ben Schumann Highway, driving up to Pretoria and Jean Avenue. So there's a heavy backlog there as well. And a big crash with big delay between Nigel and Heidelberg, south and southern parts of Kauteng. If you're driving R42, uh, lengthy queues both ways. Two crash scenes coming in from the south coast towards Durban. Uh, crash scene at Amonsum Toti and another up by Prospect. And so queue, two queues to work through there. M7, very heavy from Queensbury down towards the uh, Bay, the uh, Belleville Wakesley Road Junction on your way to the Bluff. And no traffic lights, Kormashu Highway at the end too. That stays heavy out of Kormashu as well. Uh, Cape Town, Baden Powell Drive closed at Monmo BC, but it's the closure between Strandfontaine and uh, Musenberg that's put a lot of traffic into the Strandfontaine area on a divert. Lights are out. Robert Sabukwe, Stellenbosch Arterial. That's heavy at the back of the airport. And the N1 into Cape Town still queuing up as you come through Platycliffe Hill uh, down towards Marine Drive. With your traffic updates, I'm Rob Byrne. SAFM Sunrise. A vivid start to your day. Seven after eight. Good morning. You're with SFM, SFM Sunrise. I'm Stephen Critters. Good to hear from you this morning. You know the number, 86 Issues we've been talking about. We've been talking about uh, the situation regarding government services. That's because of the comments we heard from Ruben Maleka, the Public Servants Association, saying that public service workers are productive. I use the example of what happens when you go to get a driver's license. Do you find everyone there is productive? We've had some uh, comments from people about that. Conversations, too, still about Nosa Mapisa Ngakula, the uh, former Minister of the National Assembly. Other conversations coming through as well this morning. Have you ever stopped to ask, why do you believe what you believe? 
I'm not saying, why do you believe the sky is blue? I'm saying, why do you believe Russia was right or why you believe Russia was wrong to invade Ukraine, uh, for example? Well, it's about a big international fight for influence. It's about, I suppose you could say, it is also about the fight for your opinion. We'll talk about that, the international struggle for your opinion from 8.30. All of that to come. Also, by the way, issues around water, huge issues at the moment around water. You know the number, 8 after 8. Conversations that you connect with and react to. SAFM. All right, Andrew on the line from Cape Town. Andrew, hi. The provision of water you heard uh, from the Deputy President spokesperson earlier. Go for it. Yes, good morning. Um, actually, the two issues, and I don't know if it's by accident or design or if anybody's noticed, but the two issues which came up this morning which are connected, that is public service and water. Uh, the fact that you've got water problems now, I think, are due ninety percent due to the fact that there's public service failure. But that is a side issue. The point that I wish to make, it seems that the discussion has actually sort of gone off course a bit here. Yeah, nobody's really talking about, <clears throat> at least the minister, the deputy president, wasn't talking about privatization or even investment in water services. What he's talking about here was the failure of municipalities to reticulate water. That is essentially what it is about. And this is an old problem. It goes back for ages. I don't know why all of a sudden it's making headline news. We've known about this for years, and we've known (coughs) that there's always been a water crisis looming. What worries me is that the president, at least the deputy president, is calling upon interest groups or associations to step in and assist local government. Now, this is not the role of these organizations to assist local government. Local government there has a constitutional duty to reticulate water. It's as simple as that. That is what we pay taxes for. Now, to, for, 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 the, for David President to call upon mm. these other organizations is actually a total admission of failure mm. of governance at virtually every level, not only local level, but also at national level, which is responsible for the bulk mm. supply of water. I remember <clears throat> there was one of the big schemes that Cogta produced some years ago uh, to improve local governance was this idea of business adopting municipality, a bizarre notion mm. that businesses were supposed to come in and lend their support and their expertise to get municipalities going. And incidentally, one of the issues they wanted to address was water, particularly in Nelson Mandela Bay, where I think South African breweries got caught up in this mess and tried to assist them with their water problems. Mm. Of course, it turned to nothing. And I think the point that you have to keep in mind there, A, it's the function of municipalities to do this. That's what we're there for. And B, what makes people think Mm. that if municipalities can't do their job, people from the outside should come Mm. in and help them. Mm. They're in no better position to assist us. What it boils down to really is, as you say, is politics, whether you like it or not. And it's not so much about the opposition making a story about it. Water provision is part of government and therefore by its very nature is politicized. Yes. So you can't avoid it. You simply cannot mm-hmm. avoid it. But this solution which the Deputy President <clears throat> is calling on, I don't wish to sound pessimistic, but we've been there before, and I think that it's doomed to failure. There are other solutions, and they are political when you get down to bust. All right. No, Andrew, it's very interesting. I mean, I think you're right. You can't get away from the council part of it. And if you, if the council's involved at all, it does become political. Exactly so. Exactly so. And you can't, as I say, from a constitutional point of view, mm. from a practical point of view, from ideological mm. point of view, it just it commands the admission mm. uh, of failure if you're now calling on organizations like AfriForum or Agribusiness or whatever to do it. Simple as that. All right. Thank you. Uh, Andrew on the line from Cape Town. Interesting point there. Thank you. Uh, Tommy in KZN. Tommy, uh, you've already come up this morning on the radio. Hello. Yes, uh, Stephen. Says, actually, I was inspired by one of the callers who challenged me. Yes. And then petitioned you to call me back about some of the, my arguments that he refers to, he characterizes to, the, to them as guerrilla tactics. It's mm. not a guerrilla tactics. It is, it, 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 these are concepts that are there in the legal mm. discourse. Mm. It's, not, it's not a guerrilla tactics. For instance, there's something called prima facie case. It's a concept. It simply means. It's a collective on on the face of it, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it means, uh, it's on the face, but it also means, on the face of it, I have gathered 
sufficient yeah. evidence yeah. when you say prima yeah. facie case. So in the justice system, you've got investigating directorate within the police who must satisfy themselves. Mm. They must then say prima facie case does exist before yeah. they hand over to the NPA. The NPA does the same. If there are gaps, they refer back to mm. the investigating directorate. The prima facie case is a concept that guides whether the person is sure. taken to court or not. And only the court will then use a, 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 a beyond reasonable doubt. Sure. And, and, and Stevens, uh, you say we must choose. We must choose. We chose the separation of powers. The people will only be punished after they've been proven beyond mm. reasonable doubt in court, competent court of law. So the commission is not a court of law. That's why people are not mm. dragged. And I've been to that. Um, even so, your, so, your, so your, Tommy, your, Tommy, I've been thinking about this over the weekend, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but if I understood your argument last week, what you were saying was that Nosavuima Pisa Ngakulu was being treated unfairly because people were demanding that she uh, step down from her position before she'd been found guilty, right? That, that's very correct. That's okay. So, 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 so imagine this, right? If I go on the radio on a Monday morning and I say to steal is wrong, and tomorrow on X or Twitter you see a video of me stealing something, and you can see that I walk into the store, I put the chocolate in my jersey, and I walk out of the store, you can see that I've stolen it. Do you think, do you really think, and that everyone sees that video, do you really think that I can go on the radio on, t- on Tuesday morning? and say to steal is wrong. I mean, isn't that what we're dealing with here? That's the issue. Exactly, exactly. That's what is what we must do. No, 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 but the this is what I'm saying. People are there to guide us to act in the restraint. So, Even if you shoot somebody on a broad daylight, you still need to be taken to court. Absolutely, why, but why can I still do it? To jail but, instantly? No, but Tommy, what I'm saying is, could I still come on the radio the next morning when the whole world has seen me... Whoa, I don't know what happened there. But Tommy, can I still go on the radio the next morning when the whole world has seen me steal this chocolate and say, yes. you know, you mustn't steal? You think I can do that until a court finds me guilty? That's very correct. I don't think that everyone else sees it that way, Tommy. I yes, really don't. Yes, it, 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 yes. Probably for the people who are outside the legal community, they look at things mm. at, at the physical aspect. You know, no. in terms of the law, there is a letter of the law. There is yes. a spirit of the okay. law. Let me, let, let, let me put it like this, right? I, I mm. don't know if you have children, so, so I'm just going to say, can, can you say to me that if I know that this person um, is a very bad driver, even though they haven't been convicted of breaking the law, I must treat that person the same as every other taxi driver. Surely not. I can make decisions about where, who I trust my children to or who I trust my money to. And in this case, I think, as voters, we can make decisions about who we trust our vote with. It doesn't matter whether someone's been convicted or not. If you've seen that Stephen stole that chocolate, you're not going to vote for Stephen. And that also means you're not going to listen to Stephen the next morning. And that also means the management of the radio station has to make a decision to remove Stephen. Yes, there are issues where you can use your own discretion. <laughs> there are issues where you use when you yeah. say somebody has violated a written law. <sighs> the law must be written for you to then say we have violated. So on issues that are not regulated by law, it's something else. But on the issues that are regulated by law, it's, mm. it's something different. Let me make a... Please, please Very quickly, on the Tommy. other day, mm. yes, please follow up on the issue to, 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 to a, a practical example. Go and follow up on what happened to Mark Mabuyakul. It was no, no, I know what happened, and I know that he was, he was found elected, innocent. I know that. He was taken yeah. home. Yes. He suffered. His rights were infringed wrongly. I know that. Later on, they said the case is not there. Yeah, all right. Tommy, on the line from Cape Town, um, I'm from kwazulu Natal. excuse me, we have heard you, and we have heard the argument, and the Mike Mabuyakul argument is a strong argument. Mopotle and Swana, you have a science lesson for us, Mopotle. Good morning, yes. Yeah, that Tommy guy can speak, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Welcome me back. Please welcome me back. I've been away. I know, we've missed, your si- we've missed your science lessons. There's a solar eclipse. Does that prove that the Earth is still flat? There is this. Uh, there's a total solar eclipse taking place yeah. in, the, in the evening today in South African time, but it's happening in America. In the, yeah. Yes, and then what it means... Is that now, uh, Sen? I don't know if you know Sen. 
it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, okay, it's a send, they, they, they'll be opening a portal. Yeah. yeah. This portal is going to invite, you know, aliens into our. Really? Earth. Yes. And they now, want... what is happening? What, what is happening with this uh, total eclipse, solar eclipse? Basically, what it means is there's going to be drastic changes. We are going to see changes coming in, into effect with the war, you know, in in in, in Palestine and in Israel, okay. intensifying. People who took the jab, mm. the triple sixers, I call them. <laughs> now they are going to be experiencing the difficulties. Okay. Before. Well, you can call me an 18 if you like. Um, so, so Maputle, the aliens are coming even though the world is flat. They don't mind the fact the world is flat. They're still no, coming. no, remember, remember the world, the way it is, like, it's mm. shaped like a pancake. You know that, Muslim. Mm. There are also other, other you know, uh, beings that are not from this uh, the realm of the territory. That the, the, the elite normally would, would occasionally invite when occasions like your total solar eclipse, your earthquakes mm. and all that take place. Now, mm. it, their, their, their main aim and mission is to create chaos for us. Okay. So do, we, do we really need aliens to do that? I think I'm pretty good at doing it myself. <laughs> I think you can do it. <laughs> Thank you for having me back. Uh, sure. I'll call again. No. This is still free, man. This is still free. <laughs> <laughs> Maputle, thank you. Maputle from Tswane and his uh, science lessons. The Earth is flat. The aliens are coming um, through the complete solar eclipse. Um. But we're not having a complete solar eclipse here, so I, don't, I mean, maybe they're not coming here. I don't know. Maybe they don't like us. 20 minutes after 8. South Africa is facing an increase in people diagnosed with non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, cancers, hypertension, lung problems and obesity. This also increases the number of people living with these diseases and mental health. Many people living with these preventable diseases may not be immediately aware unless they go for health screening and testing. It is our responsibility to invest in our healthier future through regular physical activity, healthy diets and avoiding risky health behaviours such as alcohol and tobacco use. The Department of Health urges people to go for regular health screening for early detection and effective treatment if they are diagnosed with any of these conditions. This message is brought to you by the National Department of Health. The boys of Steve Parker resist to leave the pitch without a ticket to the semis. But there's a big problem. Kevin Hunt's boys say the last dance of happiness belongs to them. This is the Netbank Cup quarterfinal battle. Stelis versus Matatanza Pitori on Saturday, 13 April at 2.30 p.m. Live on SABC One and SABC Radio Stations. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag, we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. For the love of the game. The Science of Life on SAFM. Well, as we go into day 12 of no load shedding around the country, there's still many, many people who are installing solar panels on their roofs. And, of course, around the world you actually see this, not just uh, because of load shedding, but because it makes, uh, over the long run for many people, uh, economic sense. But several municipalities now will also buy electricity back from you if you are generating an excess. Places like Joburg, Cape Town, Mangaung will do this. Mohamed Mahdi is an energy expert and also the country director for South Africa at Yellow Door Energy. Mohamed, good morning. Hi, good morning, uh, Stephen. Just to correct it, I'm, I'm actually the CEO of Sinan Energy, not, not the country director of Yellow Door. Yes, my apologies. I don't know where that came from. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so so we see more and more councils around the country uh, being prepared to buy electricity from households. Is the system by and large working? I mean, technically it's not that difficult, but you do need special meters. Um, y- yes, good morning to yourself and the viewers. You're right, you do need special meters. Uh, these meters are f- uh, freely available and fairly easy to install. So the problem is not really the metering. Um, the problem that did persist in the past is that many of the municipalities, their billing systems, their internal billing systems, were not geared up to be able to pass these credits or to pay the cash out, as the case may be, to the end users. That has changed over the last several years. But if you look at, you know, city of Johannesburg, for example, uh, it still persists. So that is still a problem in terms of their billing systems. Uh, the last we had any information about that, and it would be good to follow up on that. So, so sometimes the legislation is in place. You're able to do the net metering, but the uh, city's underlying back office systems cannot cope with it. But as I said, that, those incidences are now much less than the past. 
Um, I presume that some councils are offering a little bit more money than others, and I don't know if there'll be space for competition here, but there's probably also a limit to how much they can actually really pay. I mean, sometimes they're really desperate for electricity, uh, and sometimes they sort of aren't. So to try and actually manage the pricing of this is not an easy thing. No, it's not an easy thing. And look, um, municipalities in general are desperate for electricity. There, there are very few municipalities that don't need the extra capacity. Having said that, the pricing mix is quite a complex task for the municipalities and also comparing municipalities against one another without looking at the solar radiation levels in each of those cities. Um, you know, it's only looking at half the picture. To give you an example, in... Uh, in you know, KwaZulu-Natal, most of the cities in KwaZulu-Natal have much lower radiation, much lower solar radiation than other parts of the country. So consequently, your solar panels are going to yield less kilowatt hours for the same capacity. On the flip side of that, if you look at some of the cities in Gauteng and, uh, you know, of course, the Northern Cape, but, but let's take Gauteng as an example to, to um, KwaZulu-Natal, we have... 20, 30 percent more solar radiation in terms of kilowatt hours per kilowatt of installed capacity. Cape Town falls somewhere in between uh, KwaZulu-Natal and uh, Johannesburg. So, so these factors need to be taken into account when looking at the pricing, looking at what's affordable from the re resident's point of view or the user's point of view, as well as from the city's point of view. Does predictability matter as well. So KwaZulu-Natal and the Western Cape, particularly because they're by next to the coast, they have a lot more wind and perhaps more weather variability. Um, to put it another way, the weather in Gauteng over the winter period, Mohammed, I don't need to tell you this, is incredibly boring. I can probably tell you now that of if we say uh, there's 60 days through that winter period, let's say, I can probably tell you now that 55 of them will have sunlight from around quarter past seven to around call it five o'clock, reliably and predictably. I mean, that must help manage this too. Well, just on a side note, you know, I think the tennis players and the pedal players will probably disagree with that predictability. But nonetheless, um, you, you're quite right. Solar, however, is very predictable in the way that it is designed today and in the way that it is simulated and the amount of yield per panel is predicted. And this is because the underlying software applications that are used uh, hook into databases. We call these metronome or other sorts of databases. And these databases have decades of information in them. So when predicting the yield from a solar panel, you're typically looking at a database, you know, that stretches for, for many decades. So you have a fairly reliable output. Now, you and I may have experience, you know, over several years, and we apply that anecdotally. But when, when designing a solar system, it's very, very precise and, and it's fairly predictable. And then does that affect the price? Because that makes it easier for a council to rely on. They know in Joburg, for example, we're going to get this so we can kind of work out the price. And in the Western Cape, I mean, it's not so predictable. Maybe you need to do the pricing slightly more complex. Yeah, so I think even in the Western Cape, in fact, almost any part on the globe, uh, you know, the solar database is very, very comprehensive. So the level of predictability of your solar yield from one town to another is not, a, uh, is not very much. So it doesn't really affect the price too much. The actual yield, of course, that affects the price. But in terms of predicting how much you're going to get over the course of a year from a you know, particular amount of installed capacity of solar, that is fairly well known. And, and municipalities use that in their pricing. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mohamed Amadi. Uh, of course, is the CEO at uh, at Sinan Energy, and uh, he's been with us this morning. Mohamed, thank you. Really appreciate the time. Twenty seven minutes after eight. This is SAFM Sport with Zai Khan. Zai, good morning. What happened with the Sharks? Oh, they took a bite out of the competition. Seven tries is what they put past Italian Minnow Zebra that was in Durban yesterday to earn a comfortable passage through to the Challenge Cup quarterfinals. Having taken a 21-3 lead at halftime, the Sharks eased 47-3. That was their victory at Kings Park as John Plumtree's side kept alive their hopes of capping a difficult season with some silverware. 
The Sharks will host Edinburgh, that's in the quarterfinals in Durban, having recently beaten the Scottish side in the URC. Meanwhile, at the Hong Kong 7, South Africa's Blitzbox showed spirit and determination. After a less than stellar performance in Los Angeles, the team rallied, proving their grit on the international stage. Despite a sluggish start against Fiji, the Blitzbox navigated through the challenge, culminating in a notable sixth place finish, a significant leap from their previous 11th place. While New Zealand say they have a target on their backs at the Paris Olympics after beating France 10-7 to retain their Hong Kong 7s crown. Making it a double celebration for New Zealand, their women's side also successfully defended their Hong Kong title with a 36-7 thrashing of the United States. And golf, Dion Jermhase claimed his second Sunshine Tour title when he won the Limpopo Championship by two strokes at the Euphoria Golf and Lifestyle Estate yesterday. Jermhase signed for a final round of 66 to win on 22 under par and add to his victory in the 2022 Sichuan Classic. Jacques Blau, who led by one stroke over Jem Hayes, going into the final round, finished second on 20 under par with a closing 69. Jacques Kreisweg and Dylan Mostat shared their third place on 17 under. More South African good news as Dean Burmester won for the first time on the Live Golf League, closing with a 4 under 68 and beating Sergio Garcia. Burmester won for the third time in the last five months. He won the Joburg Open as well as the South African Open late last year. And in women's golf, Nelly Korda won for the third week in a row, claiming her fourth straight ladies PGA Tour start. She defeated Ireland's Leona Maguire 4-3 and three to win the T-Mobile match play title at Shadow Creek Golf Course in Las Vegas. And finally, Athletics, following his achievement as the first South African to reach the finish line at the APSA Run Your City Tobeja Challenge yesterday, Elroy Halant remains steadfast in his pursuit to secure an Olympic qualification for the 42.2 kilometer marathon. Despite being 37 years old, Halant shows remarkable determination, clinching second place in the men's race ahead of, well, just behind the Kenyan winner, Vincent Langhart, who clocked 28 minutes and one seconds, and it was under cold and windy condition. Halant now turns his attention to the Durban International Marathon, scheduled for the 28th of April. That's a wrap of your sport on Sunrise. We'll bring you more sport on SFM around half past 12. I'm Zai Khan. Zai, thanks very much indeed. The global battle for influence. That's your mediated conversation to have power over you. That's coming up next. You're with SFM leading, your, leading the conversation at 30. Good morning. In the headlines, the bail application of five suspects in the murders of Keenan, a.k.a. Forbes, and Tibelo Tips Mutsuane will resume today in the Durban Magistrates' Court. The Mkonto Wesizwe party will today head to the Electoral Court to challenge the Electoral Commission's decision to disqualify the former President Jacob Zuma from standing for public office. And the South African Weather Service says the current inclement weather in some parts of the country, especially the Western Cape, will start to clear from wind. Wednesday. I'll have details on these and other stories at nine. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Let's give you the good news first. The R24 between the airport and Galuli, those uh, crash scenes are being cleared. And the R21, uh, big pardon, the N1 south, uh, coming out of Pretoria uh, between Castle and Rigel, that uh, crash all lanes open there. It's basically out of the way, but there is a big backlog still from Limwood uh, down to about sort of Castle Atterbury Road territory. It's still a very heavy backlog, although once you get past that, uh, the crash scene is out of the way. Uh, that's where the good news uh, ends, I'm afraid. There's a breakdown further down the N1 at Olifant Fontaine, so that stays heavy from Brock Fontaine interchange. Uh, crash on the N14, driving to Pretoria at Jean Avenue. So from the N1, Brockfontein uh, interchange, that's heavy as well. A lot of pressure on the N1 into the Willie Mandela off-ramp. The lights are down again on Willie Mandela and Sloan just on the southern side of the highway. So coming out of four ways, it's heavy and trying to uh, get into that traffic off the uh, N1 north and south, very heavy as well. Uh, Vic Coppin Road with protesting boulders, rocks, uh, planks and burning tires and fires. Vic Coppin at Paul's off. Uh, latest there is the exit from four ways and coming in from Lone Hill, uh, Vic Coppin at Main Junction staying heavy. Uh, Durban, no lights, Marshu Highway at the N2, that stays really busy. A breakdown in the usual spot before Spaghetti Junction. So queues coming down from Umgena Road. M7 towards the Bluff stays heavy from Queensborough down to Bel Air and Wakesley. And Cape Town, no traffic lights. 35th Avenue, Stellenbosch Arterial, plus a bit of flooding further up 35th at Bishop Avenue, so, uh, Bishop Lavis. So uh, traffic all over that area, just north of the uh, airport uh, region. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic.
Two years since winning the EFC middleweight title in the most dramatic and controversial fashion, Luke Michael finally defends his belt for the very first time at EFC 112 against the imposing submission machine, J.P. Kruger. And in the co-main event, featherweight champion Iga Smiley Cabessa becomes the next athlete aiming for champ champ status as he battles the imposing Kaleka Block Cabanda. EFC 112 live this Thursday. Watch it on SABC Sport Channel on DTT Channel 4 from 7 p.m. Brought to you by SABC Sport. Banyana, banyana. African champions and top 16 team in the world are in action on Tuesday, the 9th of April at the Loftus Fastball Stadium at 7.30 p.m. They are on the road to the Paris 2024 Olympic qualifiers as they face Nigeria for the last spot in the Olympics. Join us to hashtag Philip Loftus. Tickets are available at Ticket Pro at 50 Rand for adults and 20 Rand for children under 12 and scholars in uniform. You can also watch the match live on SABC Sports on DTT Channel 4 at 7 p.m. For more details, visit Safa.net and Banyana underscore Banyana on X. Mediated conversation on SAFM. 26 minutes now to 9 the time. Time for your mediated conversation this morning. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself this question? Why do I believe what I believe. For example, if you believe that Russia was wrong to invade Ukraine, have you ever asked, why do I believe that? If you believe Russia was right to invade Ukraine, do you ever wonder, why do I believe that? Do you ever ask yourself the question, why do I vote for this party or believe that this party is right and that party is wrong? All around you, there are people and companies and now more and more countries and governments that are trying to influence you. They want to Maybe not quite control your mind and your thoughts, but they do want your opinions. And if they can control your opinions, they can control your decisions and they can control your actions. And I know you already know this, but in recent times, it seems this battle, this struggle for your mind, if you like, is taking on new shapes. Maybe, to put it another way, 200, 150 years ago, perhaps, companies or countries tried to fight each other for control of certain resources like gold or oil or simply land. Now it seems countries and companies are competing to influence you for control of your opinion. This is your mediated conversation this morning. First, how does influence work and how can you protect yourself? Angela Fix, the Director of Research at the All Socioeconomic Research Institute. Then, how do countries compete with each other for influence? Professor David Moniai is Director at the Center for Africa-China Studies at the University of Johannesburg. And finally, haven't countries been doing this for a long time through all sorts of methods? Is Hollywood part of this, for example? Brooke Spector is an expert in international relations and associate editor at Daily Maverick. We start then with Angelo Fick. Angelo, good morning. Good morning to you and to the listeners. How do people try and influence us? How do people try and determine what we think over things like Russia, Ukraine, uh, Gaza, South African politics? How does it work? Well, it's how does it work and how does it not work? I think that we have clear flack, so um, official statements from you know, agencies or institutions that have a certain kind of official capacity. Um, the president of a country will release statements, ministers will release statements, and journalists will repeat this. But in addition to that, with new media around, we also have the dissemination of information directly from these sources without having to go through uh, journalists or editors. Um, and then there's a revolving door between journalism and spokes people. So former journalists who are now in South Africa, for example, spokes reporters um, or spokespeople who are then expected to use their journalistic cachet as, you know, people who give information to the public to consume, but on behalf of the state or of companies um, as spokespeople for private corporations. So there's a variety of ways in which this happens. And then there are other forms, which is direct advertising, given that new media now allows people um, to be given, uh, you know, to, for, for people to, to be the site of intervention by corporations on their mo- mobile phones, through their social media, through algorithmic um, patterning. Uh, you have ways of reaching people to convince them and also to skew what information they have access to. So there are varieties of ways in which that influence does happen. And I think there are varieties of ways in which they fail, which is often when people have real life conversations um, with other people um, that are not just focused on being the recipients of information from sources that they often um, are remote from or distant from. Would it be fair to say there are probably more people, more uh, entities, whether they be governments or companies or whatever, trying to influence, uh, trying to influence us in more ways than ever before? 
I think, uh, you know, it's a complex relationship between commodities um, that have shifted so that we have become the commodities, we've become the things that need to be sold. And so when you are consuming new media, you're actually providing an awful lot of data about yourself and your behavior um, to people who can then use that information to send information back to you based on the profile created. Um, and there's always been a version of that. Uh, so even the compulsory mass education introduced in the 19th century of Western European states wasn't necessarily to create a more equal society. It was to create young gentlemen, specifically gentlemen, who would be good servants of the state. And it is only in the last, you know, in the 50 years after the Second World War, that democratization and mass education were linked. But traditionally, education was to create a core of elites um, and also to create a group of people who could be useful cogs in the system. Um, and so that's not a new shall we say, aim of states. Uh, that's always been the aim to create stability by creating a class of people loyal to the idea and ideology of the state. Um, what we now see is that there is a shift to global corporations who need people to behave in particular ways for the profit of the few who own those corporations are invested in them. Um, and therefore, the metadata that we generate in our activities, on our mobile phones, on our computers, um, on our consumption of media through streaming services, um, these are all ways in which you can now begin to, con I wouldn't say control, but influence the public mind um, to believe certain things about the world that may not be in the interests of the people who believe that, but certainly functions to the profit of the few who control the means by which information is disseminated. There's been a lot of talk recently about countries trying to do this. So, for example, the sort of classic sort of Western media story you see is that, you know, this Russian bot farm was trying to change people's minds to support Russia and its invasion of Ukraine. Um, I presume this happens in many directions, in many different ways, from many different actors. There's no reason not to believe that the United States has bot farms doing exactly the same thing, um, even if bot farms are quite a crude way of doing it. Quite. Um, you know, it used to be that we would call uh, the kind of information about the world that came from totalitarian systems propaganda, um, and you would call that uh, same thing when it came from so-called democratic societies, public relations. Um, but it's more or less the same thing. And increasingly, you don't really have to be as crude as propaganda. Um, many of these states now rely on soft power. And one of your later speakers, Brooke Spector, might talk about this um, in relation to the way in which Hollywood has constructed it. But we've seen other forms of such constructions. You know, the projection of British imperial identity came through um, the cultural production. And Edward Said wrote about this in Culture and Imperialism. And so we see it for North America. And so we're beginning to see it for China and for Russia. Um, if people thought this uh, CNN was some kind of independent, uh, you know, voice that provided the truth out there. We've known since Walter Lippmann in the 1920s that the whole point of mass media broadcasting was to manage public opinion. Um, and so it's important for states who have very material interests backed by and fronting for uh, private corporations and their profit to project a certain image of themselves and of the world and of their role in it. And for a very long time, this has been taken as truth for Western democracies, but propaganda for um, first the second uh, world, the Soviet bloc, the communist bloc. And now increasingly, um, other players in the world have, have entered this phrase. So you have RT, you have China Global Television Network. There, th there's a new way in which um, you don't have to signal it is propaganda um, crudely, but you can manufacture consent either directly by having a political officer or official in the media space telling people how this is going to be covered, or you simply hire people who are not going to ask critical or tough questions and see no problem moving in a revolving door between state and corporations or between coverage as a journalist and spokesperson for state power or corporate power. How can you protect yourself from this kind of, kind of influence? So I think this has been a failure of the last 20 years of, of public education in the globalized north and of the inability or unwillingness to implement proper public education that is critically literate in the global south. I think literacy and critical literacy is a very valuable 
um, shield against exploitation. The ability to read um, for meaning is very, very crucial. And we know we live in a country in which for a very long time now, more than a decade, um, many, many of our 10-year-olds, the majority of them, couldn't read for meaning in any language. And this is certainly one of the failures that we have. So when people are confronted with information, you know, the caution that the French philosopher Jean Baudrillard gave in 1981, that we would be entering a world with more and more information, but less and less meaning, has certainly become true. The inability to weigh information up against other pieces of information and to know what is meaningful and what isn't um, is a crucial skill to navigate modern life, particularly in spaces where power and political power are crucial components that have to be understood and have to be limited. And in South Africa, in its 30th year of democracy, I think it is an important moment for us to reflect on the urgent need to have critical literate education um, and to begin to work with younger people uh, in order to strengthen their capacity for such, because people aren't born stupid. People are often made stupid through very, very bad education systems. Um, and in South Africa, we suffer from a poor quality education system that focuses on metrics and not necessarily on improving the capacity of people in that education system from grade R all the way through to PhD level uh, to engage with the world productively, critically and in their interests rather than in the interest of the system itself. Angelo Fick, thank you very much indeed. Director of Research at the All Socioeconomic Research Institute. Really appreciate the time. 16 minutes to nine, you're with SFM. Your mediator conversation continues. The people who fight to influence your opinion. Professor David Munyai is director of the Centre for Africa-China Studies at the University of Johannesburg. Professor Munyai, good morning. Good morning to you and to all listeners. How do you think countries try and influence us, whether it be the US or Russia or China? Oh, they do uh, through so many uh, ways, um, um, through the diplomats, uh, through the media that my colleague has alluded to, and through funding. Um, there's so many uh, ways, or COVID uh, way, um, through spying um, and um, um, sending message uh, to give their country or companies an advantage. So this is nothing new. It has been happening Um uh, way back, I mean, 200 years, we had uh, East India Company, a uh, British company that uh, really uh, ran um, India uh, in a way that uh, worked hand in hand with the empire. So it's a continuation of this. Uh, states do do all sorts of funny things uh, to advance their interests. I would imagine some countries might have an advantage and economics would matter. But for example, the U.S. could almost export the American way of life, or let me call it the American way of thinking, without using government money because it has Hollywood, you know. And even in China, um, until fairly recently at least, I mean, Hollywood blockbusters were a huge thing in China, which meant that Americans would be able to influence uh, the, cult, the popular culture of China, even though China and the United States, their governments sometimes don't talk to each other. Oh, indeed. I think it has been happening. Even ourselves, I think uh, we grow up with Rambo 1, 2, up to 3. I mean, we never knew when we were young that these were propaganda movies. Um, we grew up re uh, reading 1984. We grew up reading Animal Farm. Um, we, did, we didn't, at some point, we didn't know that this were uh, propaganda in the Cold War era. Uh, if you go back and, and see the kind of literature, the kind of newspaper, CNN itself and all other, whether it's Russia Today, CGTN or others, state-led media, they all do the same. So um, in case of China um, and the United States, for China, I think uh, as it started opening up, um, it was much more interested in the economic opening and not the political. Uh, I think with time, it realized that uh, it has to somehow defend itself. So, and therefore, we have the China war, certain um, uh, technologies from uh, the West are not you know, operational in China, such as Facebook and the other, uh, due to certain laws within China to limit uh, access to a particular um, what they perceive as uh, encroachment of uh, westernization, uh, not modernization, westernization. I mean, something that we all know in Africa. Is animal farm propaganda? Is some propaganda more oh, equal indeed. than others? 
Oh, yeah. Of course, the story tells a, a, a wonderful story that we all love, grow up loving. But it was written at a time when the then Soviet Union and United States um, were at each other's throat. I mean, there's a whole uh, literature around it. Um, it was part of uh, novels that were designed to uh, disadvantage the then Soviet Union. Okay, um, I think it was 1945 that it was that it was published. It wasn't. I mean, it was long before the Cold War. I mean, I realised the Cold War followed very shortly afterwards, but it was still in the middle of the Second World War that it came out. Oh, indeed, uh, there are just a number of um, literature. These are just few. Uh, if we go back and see what we learned, and therefore, I think um, going in line with what my colleague had said. It's critical to ensure that we uh, develop a curriculum um, to ensure that students learn to be able to take what they think is critical for themselves, for their country, for their continent, um, and avoid getting bogged down into other nations' uh, interests, um, whether it's war in Ukraine or in Palestine, and stand on what you think it's a principled position and uh, advancing your own interests in, in terms of development and otherwise. Um, if the United States has a bigger economy and a bigger, and a bigger um, party because of the use of the, of the language of English, a bigger sort of cultural um, establishment uh, to sort of export its values around the world, how would China and Russia, and particularly China, compete with that? And I know there are lots of ways it can sponsor academic outlets and universities, which it does, as you know. Um, it can do all sorts of other things too. But is it possible for other countries to sort of compete with the kind of cultural hegemony that the United States can sometimes appear to have? I think there's a disadvantage for developing countries when it comes to technologies. Um, as we can see, we have Starlink, um, South African born Elon Musk, um, have they have now power beyond nation states, uh, able to see uh, things that are not supposed to be seen, uh, able to influence the battlefield, uh, able to influence your five-year-old child um, in terms of Facebook and all these um, gadgets we use and so much in love with, and at times leave our kids uh, to be parented by these gadgets. Um, and, and that level of propaganda, that's where it starts. And I think countries are competing in terms of controlling these new technologies. And therefore, as this competition uh, is going on uh, in terms of influencing um, regions and areas of uh, sphere um, of control, Africa is becoming that and uh, remains the poorest and with no regulatory framework in terms of responding to some of these issues. So, therefore, it is important for South Africa, SADC, and AU to come up with protocols and find ways collectively to manage to manage their data, for instance, to manage rules so that you can push back as EU is doing for some of these big companies, whether they're coming from China or United States. And therefore, I think we just don't have that capacity. We just don't understand uh, some of these issues, even at the highest level in government and private sector. Professor David Nunyaib, thank you, Director of the Centre for Africa-China Studies at the University of Johannesburg. In a moment, the view from Brooks Beck to nine minutes to nine. AFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Uh, stays pretty heavily packed on uh, Joburg's M1 south towards the uh, William Mandela off ramps at four ways. The uh, lights are off on William Mandela and Sloan. So coming out of four ways, William Mandela so heavily backed up uh, towards the highway and across the highway that the N1 uh, north and south ramps are just, you know, you can't get off the highway and get into that traffic. That's why it's so heavy from Ravonia and uh, so heavy northbound from the uh, Randburg side as well. Uh, still got a breakdown on Route 1 through Midran. That uh, vehicle stuck just by the uh, Olifant's Fontaine exit. So if you're leaving Pretoria on route to Joburg, in fact, it's now a crash. I've just got an update. It's now a stationary vehicle there all morning. It's now just become a crash. So it stays heavy from Brockfontein all the way to Olifantsfontein. A collision going into Pretoria on the N14, the Ben Skuman before Jean Avenue. So heavy backlogging there. The earlier crash, N1 south near Rigel's being cleared, but there's still a backlog moving slowly from Stormful Road all the way through uh, towards about Linwood Road. And just back into uh, northern parts of Joburg, uh, pretty aggressive protesting this morning, uh, blocking up a section of Vicoppen Road between Four Ways and Paul's off. So that's caused a lot of traffic congestion. 
congestion around the uh, Vidkopen and the main road junction in from Lone Hill and out from Four Ways as well. Uh, Durban, the M7 remains heavy if you're bluff bound, queuing up from uh, around about Bel Air, uh, Belleville Road, in fact, right through to the N2 Highway uh, down to Belleville Road. It's been just one of those uh, really jam packed mornings that come along every so often for bluff bound traffic. Uh, Cape Town, the N2, slow go at Somerset West Victoria Street. Uh, Chapman's Peak Drive is still closed. That's uh, due to uh, uh, precautions against high winds and the storm. And just up the road a bit, Hout Bay Main Road is also closed between Deza River and Central Hout Bay. So there's a backlog of traffic Hout Bay bound that starts at around Constantia Neck. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. Mediated Conversation on SAFM. Seven minutes to nine. Continue your Mediated Conversation this morning around the battle for influence, the battle for your opinion. Brooke Spector is an Associate Editor at Daily Maverick. Brooks, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. Haven't countries always tried to influence us? Certainly bigger countries have tried to influence as many people as they can in other countries. Has this uh, game really changed in any substantive way? Well, the game hasn't changed in its purpose. The game has changed in its methods, its reach, its impact, and its immediacy in many ways. I mean, you, me, the other two panelists undoubtedly watch many different newscasts from many different countries with deluge by newsletters uh, and uh, social, other social media inputs. What we do have, most of us, if we're good at this game, is that we have the ability to discern what constitutes a campaign by country X to adjust or change our opinions by, by literally screaming a flood of material all of which tends to be very similar to say that something is wrong and it's the fault of country Y. Um, And I'm not naming countries in particular, so we don't embarrass anybody on the show. But the, the point of it is that in the 18th century, the idea of a revolutionary democratic spread was transmitted by letters, newsletters, newspapers, and pamphlets. It took, it took months to seep into the consciousness but it was very pervasive. Now, this stuff shows up with us all the time. We can't even turn it off unless, unless we have nerves of steel. Um, part of the problem is that more and more we're looking at something that uh, Angelo mentioned, which is soft power, which is not governmental in large aspects. It is the kinds of things that a society generates and the weight of it and the uh, the the what shall we say the uh, attractiveness of it? Uh, people flood the United States from around the world to attend its best universities, uh, as David Munay did, for example, because of the appeal of that kind of education. But it doesn't necessarily turn everybody into a mindless idiot, uh, just parroting U.S. government uh, ideas. Mm-hmm. Let me give you a South African example. Who's the best-known South African musician right now? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) No doubt about it. Tyla, right? She has nothing to do with the South African government. The young woman is 22 years old, and she's taken the world by storm. And it's the single single biggest musical phenomenon this country has produced in a long time. No government involvement whatsoever, but she's riding the crest. Previously, you would have had Uh, the late Nelson Mandela, as an idea man influencing the world. Uh, But now soft power in all of its manifestations comes at us in many different ways. And even things like CNN or the BBC or or Al Jazeera or uh, the China Global Television or or whatever – in the case of CNN and the BBC, their connection to a government is tenuous. Uh, if you watch CNN uh, for long enough, you realize that it's, it's critical of the U.S. government probably as often as it is critical of other places because the individual reporters and commentators are not parroting a government line. That's a little different than a chat, than a uh, uh, than, a, than a bot factory which generates thousands of social media messages, all of which have an almost identical characteristic. Okay, so you're saying there is a difference between CNN and Russia today? Uh, yes, having having spoken on both occasionally and having spoken on uh, China Global Television occasionally, 
I can tell you that CNN and, and even China Global Television don't, don't tell me in advance what it is I should say. Uh, Russia Today tried, and that was the difference, and therefore our, our relationship no longer exists. Mm. <laughs> All right. Um, does this game of influence actually work? And what I'm trying to get to is, I mean, I presume people must believe that it does, because otherwise they wouldn't put time and resources into it. But does it change the decisions that people make? To put it very crisply, do you think this game of influence changes the decisions that voters in South Africa will make in an election year, for example? It probably doesn't work at the very specific granular level of making a choice between box A and box B on a ballot. But it does make a difference in the way we construct our view of the universe. You go back to 1984 and the whole of uh, the, the book, the whole point of the, of the Ministry of Truth was to eliminate ideas and things that were uh, antithetical to the state and replace them with words, ideas, concepts that were. Um, even the word uh, freedom can be used and misused in, in many different ways. There's an article in today's Washington Post, for example, which talks to the way in which far too many Republican congressmen and senators are using phrases and comments that are virtually identical to the kinds of things that come out of the, uh, the chatbot factories in Russia. And that, that should alarm people because that's an influence. Does it affect the vote per se? Probably not. Does it affect the worldview over time? Perhaps yes. Brooke Spector, really appreciate the time. Thank you very much indeed. Associate Editor at The Daily Maverick, bringing an end to your mediated conversation today. My thanks also to Professor David Monyai, Director of the Centre for Africa-China Studies at the University of Johannesburg, and starting us off today, Angelo Fick, Director of Research at the Oral Socioeconomic Research Institute. Well, I found that absolutely fascinating. Will be podcast later if you missed part of it, if we want to go back and uh, just uh, sort of catch up with some of what was said in that conversation. But the battle for influence, you have been warned. People are out to get your mind. We will see you tomorrow from Zelma, from Melissa, from Mdu, from Stanza, myself. Look after yourself. You are there, SFM, leading the conversation. Good morning. It's nine o'clock. In our top stories, bail application of AKA murder suspects resumes and two Nigerian men charged with sextortion offences. Good morning. The bail application of five suspects in the murders of Keenan, a.k.a. Forbes, and Tibelo Tibbs Mutsuane will resume today in the Durban Magistrates Court. Last week, one of the accused, Lindo Kutlim Kwanazi, told the court that he intended to lay a charge of perjury against the investigating officer, Detective Bob Pillay. Mkwanazi and four co-accused are facing charges of murder, attempted murder, illegal possession of firearms and money laundering. The two other suspects arrested in Eswa have been appearing in court in Manzini. South African authorities have formally requested the extradition. Nonjabulum Tungwa Makamo reports. Mkwanazi claims that Pile misled the courts by falsely linking him to this case. He also denies being in possession of an illegal firearm. The courts also heard responding affidavits from Edim Yeza and Lindo Gutlim Demande, who also denied any involvement in the crimes. Today, the defense will present before court responding affidavits of alleged coordinator Mzwetemba Gwabeni and Lindani Mdimande. In election news... The Mkonto Wesizwe party will today head to the Electoral Court to challenge the Electoral Commission's decision to disqualify the former president, Jacob Zuma, from standing for public office. Last month, the commission notified the MK party that Zuma could not appear on its candidates list due to his previous contempt of court conviction. The constitution stipulates that any person convicted of an offence and sentenced to more than 12 months imprisonment without the option of a fine is disqualified from standing for public office. Zuma was convicted of contempt of court in 2021 for failing to appear before the Zondo Commission. The party's spokesperson, Nklamulo Ndlela. 
President Zuma was not incarcerated off the back of what would be Section 35 of the Constitution, where you ought to be before a judge and have a fair trial. Uh, President Zuma was incarcerated by a constitution court uh, without having been afforded a con his constitutional rights to a fair trial. So um, we cannot necessarily label it as a criminal case. You know, he all he did was contempt of what would be contempt of court, and that is not a criminal case. It's more so a civil matter. Um, and the IEC Act refers to a criminal matter. The South African Weather Service says the current inclement weather in some parts of the country, especially the Western Cape, will start to clear from Wednesday. It has issued a severe weather alert for areas in the southern and central parts of the country where rain and thunder showers are expected. SCBC meteorologist Rasim Pimpo says sunny skies and warm temperatures will return by Friday. We're expecting all those showers and thunder showers, mostly over the central parts, moving towards the interior of the Western Cape. That is where the most effect will be felt towards the beginning of the week. Look, cut-off flows are actually is their prime during April. We get them in autumn and spring. If you remember, we go back towards the KZN flooding. We got them when autumn kicked in. We're expecting wind speed of up to 75 kilometers per hour can gust up to 85 kilometers per hour. So we're talking damage to structure mostly and also making it difficult on the roads. It is a serious warning. Meanwhile, the Johannesburg Emergency Services has called on residents of low-lying areas to be cautious as heavy rains lash most parts of the city. Yesterday, the South African Weather Service issued a warning for rain and thunderstorms in Gauteng. It says the weather conditions will result in localized flooding. Johannesburg EMS spokesperson Nana Khadebe says motorists should also be extra vigilant as roads are slippery. The City of Johannesburg Emergency Management Services has not received any flooding alerts with this continuous rain. We, however, want to urge people living in low-lying areas to be careful, and in case of any flooding alerts, we are going to alert them. This is areas around Alexandra, Dipslot, and parts of Soweto where it usually floods. We would also urge motorists to drive very carefully, make sure that you can see a vehicle in front of you to avoid any accidents. And finally, two men in Nigeria have been arrested and charged over an alleged blackmail case that led to a boy in Australia taking his own life. The BBC's Phil Mesa reports. Cyber detectives believe the Australian schoolboy was hounded to death by high-pressure threats from extortionists in West Africa. It's thought to have begun with an unsolicited friend request from a stranger on social media. There was friendly banter, followed by the exchange of intimate images and blackmail. Two men in Nigeria have been arrested over the alleged conspiracy, but are unlikely to be charged with causing the death of the teenager. Australian authorities are warning that the sexual extortion of children is a global problem. Recapping the top story, the bail application of five suspects in the murders of Keenan, a.k.a. Forbes, and Tibelo Tibbs Mutswane will resume today in the Durban Magistrates Court. For SAFM News, I am Anne Musa. SAFM 104 to 107 nationwide. Leading the conversation. For over 40 years, people around the world have been spinning and winning thanks to the Wheel of Fortune. Now it's your turn to take the prize as this legendary game show finally launches in South Africa weekdays, 7.30pm on S3, plus an omnibus Saturdays at 10.30am with rebroadcast on SABC2, 9.30am. Don't miss your chance to be part of history. Enter now on www.wheelofortunesa.tv and let the wheel decide your fate. Channel your inner wordsmith on Wheel of Fortune on S3. Open up. S3. Channel your inner adventurer on Top Travel this Saturday night at 8.30 on S3 as Bez and Anesu are in Lompopo for tea with a rooibos-loving hippo named Jessica. Jumping off Hraskop Gorge in Pomalanga, Fez screams from the top all the way to the bottom. But standing at God's window will leave anyone speechless. That's Top Travel, the Saturday night at 8.30, repeat Sunday at 1pm on S3. S3. 
SAFM has signed a code of conduct that is enforced by the Broadcasting Complaints Commission of South Africa. Under the code, we are committed to giving news that is accurate, comment that is fair, and programming that is not harmful, does not amount to hate speech, or contain violence or explicit sex. If you think we are not living up to that code, then you can inform the Broadcasting Complaints Commission of South Africa. Direct any complaints in writing to the Broadcasting Complaints Commission of South Africa. PO Box 142365 Craig Hall 2024 Fax to 011-326-3198 Or an email to bccsa at nabsa.co.za For more information, please visit www.bccsa.co.za Talking Point with Kathy Mosasana. Weekdays, 9 a.m. till midday. It was unthinkable for me to meet or know black people who would share my interests, with whom, in other words, there could be some sort of natural rapport and meeting. It was always on the servant-master basis, and even if you were the child of the master and the mistress, you still had this, this particular position. Being troubled about it, great reader as I always was, beginning to find out that there was something called racism that existed in the world, and I was living in it, I was part of it. And then when I was older and went very briefly, took the train every day and went to the university, and there for the first time I met, even then there were One or two, there were a few young blacks. Remember, the university, of course, was um, whites only. But there were certain courses that were not available in the black universities. And then, as a concession at postgraduate level, a few blacks would come in. And so I met one or two black people with whom I had far more in common than I had with the young whites that I knew in the town. I was not um, interested, I wasn't sporty. All many of the things that they did were of no, not particular interest to me. And here were young people black, who were trying to write, who were beginning to write. So we had this enormous, not just ambition, we had this enormous way of approach to life and the the mystery of life and social questions in our own lives. And then I began at that age to make black friends. And then as I myself became a a young published writer, um, then I moved into a different circle, which was, um, again, journalists, actors, people who, in the arts, who normally indeed don't follow the rules, the conservative rules, and where the feeling about the incredible distortions of racism, not only the oppression of blacks, but the distortions in your personality, in your mind as a white, these became very much part of uh, my life and indeed started um, my way to freedom from racism, from racist ideas that I'd been inculcated at school, at home, everywhere since childhood. And I guess that's part of the reason why she was such an icon of her day, but also remains, I think, an icon of our struggle. That is South African Nobel laureate Nadine Gordimer, an anti-apartheid activist and internationally acclaimed author. She was also, of course, uh, one of the activists involved in reviewing the statements prepared uh, by the Ravonia trialists during the court proceedings. It's 11 after 9 o'clock. Welcome. Welcome to The Talking Point. I'm Kathy Mulhatlana. A pleasure to be with you as we kickstart a brand new week. Of course, I'm with you until midday from what is, you know, a very overcast, rainy Johannesburg. Um, certainly, that's the view that we have over the city at our Auckland Park studios this morning. And I know that... Um, It's raining in most parts of the country, including some of those uh, severe weather warnings that have been issued um, for some provinces. So I hope that if you're on the road, uh, you're taking extra caution, but especially uh, for those that have been given severe weather warnings, including at the Western Cape, that you're keeping a close eye on the latest announcements that are coming, whether it's from the weather service or even from disaster management teams in your area. It will be the Western Cape and KZN that have received some of the um, higher alerts for severe weather in the next couple of days. So 
And please, let's all just be extra mindful and be intentional about getting ourselves updated with what we can expect weather-wise. Of course, we'll kick off the first hour of the show with the open line. I'm getting ready uh, to take your calls on the National Roundtable. 086-000-2032 is the number to dial. On the WhatsApp voice note line, 0614-104-107. And on Twitter, at SFM Radio, the hashtag there, SFM talking point. Uh, Of course, there's a lot that we can get into not least of which, I suppose, because, you know, we are full on in election season. Uh, We're seeing more and more of the parties launch their manifestos. Just this past weekend, we had the DA um, launching its manifesto. And of course, um, the DA leader, John Steenhuisen, has set tongues wagging over some of the comments that he made this past weekend. I'm going to play you the clip uh, just before we get into the open line. And I want to know what uh, you actually make of John Steenhuisen's uh, comments. I don't want to say uh, sort of partly what has been said not on social media, uh, mean, maybe different other platforms, but I'd really love to hear your own reflections on some of the statements that he made. And they were launching that manifesto out in PAL over the weekend. I'll bring you that clip shortly. What you can expect coming up over the show In the 10 o'clock hour, we're going to be continuing our conversation. It's our series on Freedom Month, and we're reflecting on 30 years of democracy. Can you be free when so many people, millions that is, feel that they are excluded from the economy, feel that they're unable to access um, their rights? So what does freedom mean in this context? We'll be joined by a panelist of guests that are going to be reflecting on this for me. And I want to know from you, what does freedom mean to you? You can send me WhatsApp voice notes for the second hour of the show on this issue. What does freedom mean? mean to you. I'd love to hear from you on this issue and we'll finalize the conversation then uh, in the 11 o'clock hour. We'll be taking a look at pronunciation. Was it was it Colin or Mike? I think it was Colin. It was Colin last week uh, that created quite a stir <laughs> on, on the show. He called in during the open line and after raising his point um, you know, he was aggrieved with how Mike in Middleburg pronounces NATO. He doesn't say um, NATO, he says NATO. And so, the you know, Colin sparked an entire debate. I can't tell you uh, the number of responses that we got from uh, the rest of our listeners. So we're going to continue with that uh, conversation, this time from an official view, right? Pronunciation, we've, br- we've brought in the language experts. We've brought in the language experts. And uh, that's the conversation that you can expect in the final hour of the show. Uh, so that's what's coming up on the talking point between nine and midday. In a moment, I'll be taking your calls. Uh, and of course, remember, it is your national roundtable. You're more than welcome to raise whatever issues you may want to put on the agenda. But like I said, this seems to have caused quite a stir. I'm going to play that clip. I want to know what you make of the comments that were made by the DA's leader, John Steenhuisen, at his party's manifesto launch this past weekend. Let me tell you, unlike the rest of the country, the biggest enemy of progress and opportunity here in the Western Cape is not an ANC government desperately clinging to power like they're doing in the other eight provinces. The biggest risk to continued progress, to continued opportunity and building a better future for all of us in this province is complacency and mercenary parties like the PA, like Rise Zansi, like Good, and like the NCC. Because they're not interested in taking on the ANC. Why aren't they campaigning in Limpopo and the Northwest Province? Why are they coming to the Western Cape? Why are they coming here to try and 